and hopefully this is going to record on YouTube. Let's cross our fingers. There we go. And we are live. I love it. I love it. Love it. We already got 14 people watching. We got Aaron I in the chat, Bill H, Michael, um, Eric PPG Lear, Deweese Milstead's in the house. And it looks like we are actually cruising for a bruising. Good. I'm glad everybody's here. And uh, I'm going to try to make sure that um, we, I, I muted everything. All right. Good deal. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sean Simons, also known as PPG Grandpa. Welcome to PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast. You can search for us anywhere for PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast. If you want to see us, make sure you go to Clear Prop TV. Listen to us if you don't want to see our ugly mugs over on paratalk.org. Tonight, we got a special special guest for you, which I will introduce to you in just a moment, full of interesting stories. And uh, you won't believe some of the things that he's uh, going to tell you tonight. But let me go ahead and introduce to you everybody that's on the panel. We got JP Tulo in the house, also known as TikTok Tulo. What you what you doing there, buddy? Are you TikToking? Oh, nothing, nothing you TikToking? Just, happy, just happy to be here. And, uh, <laughs> I'm happy that you're here too, buddy. Set up. Um, hey, real quick. Um, you are making videos on TikTok, right? You have had a couple million hits on one of them. Are you still doing as good as you were doing before? Uh, it's really dropped off ever since that, to be honest with you. I, I get, you know, uh, a little spike here and there, but uh, that little nut flick from that kitty cat <laughs> was definitely my, my uh, <laughs> peak moment there, my claim to fame, but uh, I still have fun with it. It's not all about the views. It's Really, I like making stuff and then going back, you know, a month's time, a year's time, even and going back and just being like, man, I remember that that flight with with Hay Bale. And, you know, I've got a real cool video with us. We do a, a tip touch and just doing, you know, some light acro. And it's just, uh, yeah, yeah. Check out check out Brian's uh, wallpaper there. That, that was a good flight. And it's just uh, oh, yeah. it's nice, nice to reminisce, you know brings back a very nostalgic feeling just putting together little video clips like that i i, I have fun with it awesome and you can always find him at jptulo.com or ppg tulo.com or ppg jp.com jp yeah there we go ppg jp.com or jp tulo.com check it's TikTok out sounds like it's awesome uh we also got brian haybill waller he's our very famous uh, person here uh brian welcome and thank you very much for joining us hey man i was glad to be here uh had some good flights had some good experiences lately and uh, we i'm looking forward to hearing jared's story um just in the little pre-show i can tell that uh He's got a lot of good stories to tell for sure. I think we're going to learn something from him tonight. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. But check it out on ppgbrian.com. You can find my YouTube and uh, watch my videos. I got a few training videos out there. Um, I'm actually getting into the process of being an instructor myself. So there'll be some videos coming out about that soon, hopefully. But uh, yeah, y'all check it out. Enjoy the show. Absolutely. That's ppgbrian.com. Uh, we also got Jim from Canada, uh, the money that smells like maple. I, I love it. So Jim, welcome to the show, buddy. I'm glad that you made it. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. I'm, I'm telling you guys, if you don't know, you need to look up uh, Canada or Canadian money smelling like maple. Uh, it's really cool. He actually showed us on here. We did the scratch and sniff over the screen. It smells like maple. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> hey, uh, Jim, you uh, you do a lot of printing for us. You, you did our uh, calendars and you do a lot of things for other people. Um, tell us a little bit about your printing shop and how we get up with you. Sure, yeah, you can get in contact through uh, carepp.com and we can print pretty much anything for you. If you want ink on it, we can put it there and we'd be happy to help you out. And if you're into paramotoring, well, you can go to carepp.com and you can check out some of our videos and 
for team care printing. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Jim, for, for joining us. We definitely appreciate you, buddy. And thanks for helping out uh, printing up those calendars that we gave away um, this last year. And also, we got ParamomUSA.com. She's our Linda Anderson. She's our cheerleader. Yes. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Oh, my I, gosh. I'm so psyched about Mondays. Thank Mondays are so awesome. Much. Mondays are awesome. I mean, I wish I had some pom poms so I could pom pom with you. I know. I'll send you some. Um, okay. <laughs> I will pom pom with your pom poms. All right, we can do that. Absolutely. If you I'm want so to be on this, hang on to these, uh, yeah, these pom poms from my going to my Arizona Cardinals football games. You know, they give these out to everybody. And I just, as the years went on, I kept collecting them. And I'm like, there you go. So, oh, I didn't uh, know they actually gave them away. I guess I should have went there and got some. I know. Well, next but, time, next time. Very excited about being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, my chatters. Enjoy the show. We got an awesome guest tonight, Jared Kaplan. Absolutely. Oh, thank well, thank you very much. And and if you want to be on the show, just make sure you go over to ParamountUSA.com. That goes over to Linda Anderson's Facebook page. And then just say, hey, Linda, I want to be on the show. And we can get you on the show and we can chat around and talk about paramotors. I also got Will Fly, WillFlyPPG.com. Welcome to the show, buddy. And uh, you put out some really amazing paramotor videos too, don't you? I try to. <laughs> I try to. I spent all day today, though, watching uh, TikTok videos of parrot saying what the freak <laughs> i don't know if you've seen that but it's hilarious man <laughs> just parrot what the freak what the freak <laughs> no i i haven't which one is that what, what is this just look for parrots you know saying what the you know <laughs> it comes right up but yeah i don't know it's crazy stuff i got a short little flight in today and uh it was just one of those flights that uh a handful i've only had a handful of flights that i didn't particularly enjoy but this is kind of one of them man, well, man, well, it was cold well we see we see on the screen right now will fly you can find him at will fly pg he has uh five and a half thousand subscribers but look at the videos eight thousand eleven thousand six thousand ten thousand views on each video that's how well he does these videos so if you haven't seen one of will flies uh videos please go over to willflyppg.com, subscribe and hit that bell notification. You will not be disappointed. Thank you, Will, for being on the show, buddy. Thank you. And of course, the whole reason why you're here, we got, uh, we got a guest for you tonight. His name is Jared. Jared has been flying for a while. Matter of fact, he's uh, even got his instructor. Um, I, did you get your actual, you got your actual instructor? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got it uh, two years ago at the um, at the uh, longest foot drag uh, in Kansas with uh, Francesco DeSantis. Awesome. Is this you, Jared? This first one. Uh, let's see. I don't know why I'm on the view on my Zoom right now. I've only got a single thing. Uh, you guys probably can't see. I assume this is you, Jared Kaplan, PBG. Yeah, yeah. that's me. Yeah, uh, I put the link in the show notes down below. So if you wanted to check out his YouTube, make sure you go there and check it out. 63 subscribers. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and that bell notification. Um, he's going to be putting up a lot of videos very soon, he said. But yeah. uh, uh, Jared, welcome to the show, buddy. And uh, thank, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get into paramotors? Well... Um, I, you know, I've always been interested in flying. My dad, when I was very young, used to take me to Black's Beach in San Diego when he lived there. And we used to watch hang gliders fly. And uh, he said, you know, he wished he could fly. And I said, you know, someday, dad, I'm going to do that, you know. And um, interestingly enough, um, last person I dated was uh, a hang one. And for my uh, birthday one year, she got me a Groupon to take a hang gliding class uh, in Pacific City. And uh, I got off the ground, maybe eight feet off the ground on a 20 foot hang glider. And I was completely hooked. Like I was like, take my money, you know, and uh, my girlfriend talked me out of it because I was so busy at the time. There was no way I could just leave Eugene and go straight to the coast anytime the weather was good. And um, the learning curve is, is a lot greater, as you probably know, for hang gliding than it is for PPG. So um I was getting ready to travel internationally to Thailand with my family and my sister had never gone. So I was looking around for 
uh, videos of Thailand, and I came across a video of people flying on Koh Phangan. Gang. And uh, I, I immediately was like, that's what I want to do. So I, I waited till the end of the video, and they credited Black Hawk Paramotoring, um, probably for some of the gear or for the instruction. And I found out that they were only eight and a half hours south of where I live. So uh, two weeks after I got back from Thailand, I was training. And uh, there was, at the time, a great instructor named Joe Cruz. I don't know if any of you guys know Joe. But uh, Joe got me up in the air in five days. I stayed nine days. I flew 11 times and went home, kited like crazy, went back and um, got up the ground a whole bunch more, got home, put the paramotor back together. And then every flyable day, I was in the air at home since then. Um, so I, that's kind of, that was my start. And then over time, you know, just from traveling with the paramotor and meeting a lot of other pilots, um, I've just learned a tremendous amount. And I, I really wanted to learn tandem to get friends up in the air. And that's kind of where my trajectory led me, you know. Awesome. So, so what do you fly right now? What's your gear? Uh, right now I fly a mini plane fixed frame uh, with a uh, 140 prop and a, a Luna, um, a Luna 2. I've been flying a 20 meter and an 18 meter. But uh, I went from two velocity wings to a Roadster 3, like what you fly, I think, uh, 24 meter. And then I made my transition to the Luna. And I, it's been smooth sailing ever since. That's awesome. Now, um, what is your all up weight? Uh, all up weight is, I think, just over 200, like 210. I'm 150. And I think the mini plane dry weight is 43, maybe loaded 55, something like that. And I fly with a lap reserve. Okay. Um, just curious, since you fly a lot, uh, what kind of gas mileage do you get on, on that mini plane? You get pretty good, right? Yeah. Generally, you know, I think some of the longer flights have been around 70 miles, you know, um, and, uh, you know, typically we fly, I have one buddy that I fly with all the time and we go usually for anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours. You know, that's our average flight. When we were just in Moab, we figured our, our average, uh, the average mileage we covered is 52 to 56 miles a day in per flight, I should say. That's awesome. Flying. That's awesome. Yeah. That's about what I do is about um, 50 to 60 miles on my full tank, um, five gallons uh, when I was bigger. So yeah. Um, I, I love to travel a lot too, but you said what 90 miles in a day you, you could about, fly. Uh, well, I mean, in one flight, I think around 70 miles has been, has been the longer flight average um yeah and, and where i fly in in this neck of the woods i mean ultimately if it's not if i'm not fighting a long headwind and i'm not diving a lot then i i get pretty good gas mileage on the mini plane do you top off your tank like is it five gallons or what do you top off at uh, uh notoriously i think the tank is a i think it's a 10 liter tank and i i fill it to the cap every single time that that's, is, just my, that's my thing that is awesome have you triked or anything uh, ever before I do. I, I actually have a, um, a power to fly RS, uh, a, a 2019 uh, Moster, and I fly that uh, when I do tandems. And also I have a Calibri trike that pairs with that. So I've flown that. And that's that unit I've run out of gas with thinking I'm in mini plane mode. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, but uh, luckily, nothing too catastrophic. I've landed in cow field. I've landed, you know, <laughs> crazy, like half a mile short of my LZ where, you know, I wind up throwing my wing on top of the trike and just walking it back to the LC, you know? Well, I know that we've been talking uh, a couple of times before in the past about trikes and PPCs and stuff like that. And a lot of people think that, you know, once you move over to a trike, like, like Brian Haybell, you know, once you start triking, you don't want to go back to foot launch because triking is so much more fun and, and you can fly, you know, any time of the day. So, so what do you yeah. think about, since you do both, yeah. um, what do you think about triking and what do you think about uh, foot launch? What are the differences? Uh, well, for me, I mean, I'm ultimately, I'm, I'm all about foot launch. I mean, I, for me, the trike, I love doing touch and goes on the, on the trike. I like, you know, there's a lot of places that I fly in the Willamette Valley and the Coburg Valley where there are lots of roads with no power lines. So it's kind of fun to just get up, you know, upwind downwind doesn't matter just you know hit the road cruise as long as i can and then take off again um i i have the calibri trike and i i put a tandem front end on it 
but I haven't flown tandem with it. And I recently did a hang test. And what I learned was it doesn't work at least comfortably or safely with a mini plane bar um, because the way the bar rests, it winds up, at least from my experience hang testing it, it lands on the passenger's shins. So I don't really feel comfortable with that. I, I was told by some other trike guys I met at Salton Sea that the best way to probably fly this trike tandem would be with some normal paragliding bars as opposed to PPG bars where they're, they're a little bit more spread apart. Um, but I haven't done it yet. I, although I've been talking a lot about soon, hopefully soon, um, getting myself a, a power to fly Phoenix trike um, to be able to do uh, you know more commercial tandems with a passenger, or I should say just commercial tandems. Um, but as far as like, you know, the trike for me is, yeah, no wind. I mean, with the, with the Luna and with my setup and with the terrain I've been taking off on, no wind has really not been a problem. So as far as needing wheels to take off easier, I, I know it is easier, but I prefer not having the bulk of a trike. I like doing light acro and I like, you know, wing overs comfortably not as loaded as with the trike, you know, with a bigger wing. Um, so uh, I don't know. For me, it's you know, they're both great, but they definitely have different, uh, different timing, different uses. You know, absolutely. Um, yeah. Anybody on the panel have anything to say? Any questions in the chat or anything we need to address before we go on? What's your favorite uh, area to fly? Say again. What's your favorite area to fly? Ah. Uh, it really depends on the season. Um, I just got back from a trip in Moab and I, I've never flown anything like that as far as just, you know, being on another planet. Um, we were staying, we, the last time I went last year, we stayed in two different LZs, one in a canyon and one in a big open plain. And this year we went back to the open plain LZ and we found that because we had great weather, we could actually access every single thing that we did in the other, from the other LZ, from the same LZ. We just did longer flights. We flew through the Corona Arch three times. We flew all sorts of goalposts and Gemini bridges and hopping over canyon into canyon into canyon. Um, so that I think that's in the top three is Moab. Um, I think my favorite, especially you know seasonally, I I go down to. Uh, uh, Nayarit in Mexico around Sayulita San Pancholo de Marcos. Uh, I have a friend down there, Dan Dimov, who's a, uh, who's a, a amazing pilot and instructor's instructor, tandem guy. And he's who I originally learned tandem from. And I spend a bunch of time down there. Um, the beauty of it for me for years, stay in a bungalow on the beach, step over my balcony, walk 300 feet down the beach, launch and fly 20 miles in either direction, skimming beaches, flying over multi-million dollar houses, skimming in swimming pools, like epic, epic terrain. You know, cloud base winds up being, you know, 1,300 to 1,800 feet. And there, there are no rules about flying in clouds, you know, in terms of um, cloud police aren't really an issue. Um, you know, just being conscientious, stay below 4,000 feet because you could see the Puerto Vallarta airport over the mountains. Um, but just the terrain is mind blowing, being able to fly in warm weather in shorts and a t-shirt land and have, you know, tacos and margaritas and play music at night. is like, there's nothing better for me at all. I just want to live that life. You know, nice. um, I actually, it's funny. I, speaking of that, do you guys know Mike Milleron, um, of, uh, airtime PPG? I want to do a shout out to him. He's, he's been a huge influence lifestyle wise for me recently, I've been hanging out with him. He he's a full-time van lifer, PPG paraglider, um, kiteboarder friend. Two years older than me. I call him Paris Santa Bear because he looks like Santa Claus and he's like a bear in the woods when he's picking huckleberries. But um, the guy just goes from the northwest, spends the the uh, the spring and summer in the northwest, goes down to South Padre Island and does tandems and teaches down there, and then he goes to Baja, just chasing the you know chasing the good weather through the winter. And that's all he does, just lives out of his van, but does really well doing tandems and teaching. And it's uh, it's definitely inspiring, you know, to think about living that kind of life for me, at least at least part of the year, you know. Um, but as far as favorite places to fly, long winded answer to your question. Um, I'm really lucky in where I live in Eugene, Oregon, to be able to have access to 
the Willamette Valley, the Lorraine Valley, the Coburg Valley, because uh, some of the places we launch are um, in, a, in an open valley with lots of space to run in any direction. Uh, to the east, we have the Coburg Range, which are some beautiful 3,000 foot mountains with all sorts of valleys and crevices. And then uh, flying to the west, we have the Willamette River. I posted a video of 17 miles flying up the Willamette River um, over all sorts of, you know, just beautiful terrain and, and um, open farmer's fields. There's lots of places to bail out, not a lot of power lines. Um, and then, you know, an hour from where I live, hour and a half, 15 minutes from where I live is also uh, Florence Dunes and um, the Silt uh, Dunes Park, where it's an ATV park where you can legally take off and then fly the beach. You know, I fly from from Florence all the way down to Winchester Bay, which is another dune park, and then all the way up to Yahats, which is a pretty, pretty beautiful area on the coast as well. So I, I feel really lucky. So I, I can say my favorite place to fly is, you know, my home terrain, the Northwest. But as far as specialty places, you know, um, that I've been, um, you know, summertime in Mexico or wintertime in Mexico and, um, you know, the fall in Moab, for sure. Awesome. Um, Eric in the chat, ericppglear.com asked a question, said, what is the exact location in Moab you would recommend? We are going to be there through next spring without our gear. This trip will complete out a bucket list for places to fly. So where exactly in Moab would be a good place? Um, I would I would say if you want to know the LZ, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm happy if you if you uh you know, send me a message in uh, on Facebook Messenger. I'm happy to send you a pin. But uh, essentially, we were maybe a 25 minute drive from Gemini Bridges, and there is a small LZ uh, at Gemini Bridges. It's it's not a camping spot, but um, you can park your vehicle there and launch. It's like a day use only. But when I was there, we launched there twice, and it was completely wide open. There were no cars. You could run in any direction, and um, the access to amazing terrain was super easy. Yeah. But uh, there's, there's lots of places you could launch. I mean, you you can't go into the national parks, but you can fly on the periphery of the national parks out there. And the terrain is just all the same. It's so, it's epic. I mean, canyons like Grand Canyon size canyons, all sorts of sand blown mushroom looking formations, lots of things like puzzle pieces or creme brulee or a giant you know cattle jawbone of different color rocks on the tops of these cliffs just it's epic it's just like there's like it's hard to describe because even the video watching the video it's like it's hard to fathom the scope especially with the gopro you know um, absolutely I've, I've heard so many good things about moab I, that's one of the places that i would definitely like to go uh bill h in the chat said what is your social media um uh, we got the links down below in the show notes, and I think that um, JP could even show that information in in here. I want to say thank you very much to Kent Stamey. Dropped 10 bucks in the super chat, said hello all. Uh, welcome, Mr. Kent Stamey. You can find him at kentstamey.com. Who else do we have in the chat real quick? Aaron and I, the paramotor guy, Bill H, Eric, PPG Lear, Michael Flomer, Deweese Milstead, uh, Will Fly is in there too. PPG, the other Nick. Welcome, guys. Randy Milstead's in the house. Mark Floyd's, the Van Lander, Mad Sloper. We've got a lot of people doing a lot of talking. Definitely appreciate y'all uh, chatting in here, uh, asking questions. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate all that. Kevin can fly um, in the house. Will Fly, JP Tulo. Paramotor Girl, and of course, Paramotor Girl, you can go to paramotorgirl.com. She is the one that will be um, having a Paramotor podcast on Wednesday. Um, let's see, who else do we have in the house? I think we got everybody. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, anybody have any more questions uh, for Jared in the chat or the... Uh, the panel. Yeah, I, I had a question about which trike you fly. Um, sure. You know, do you have one that fits your mini plane, or do you have a dedicated trike, or what do you what do you have on that on that wheel? I have I have the Power to Fly Calibri trike, um, and I have a Power to Fly RS with a 2019 Moster on it, Moster 185. 
So that's what I've been mainly using for tandems when I need more power. I have done tandems on the mini plane as well, but usually with smaller pilots or smaller passengers. Um, but the uh, the Calibri trike, when I first got it, um, I got it at the foot drag, at the endless foot drag. And I honestly, I wasn't thinking that I was ever going to get a trike, but he gave me a smoking deal on it and he included shipping. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try it, you know? And it was, it's pretty much paired with the RS frame. So it works really well. It just, you set it down, you clip it in and it's like 10 minutes. So it's, uh, it's great as a foot launch trike. It's really sturdy. And I think it weighs about 30 pounds. Um, so eventually I wanted to do tandem on it. I asked him if I could, and he said that I, you know, could get, um, a custom front end for it. So I spent the money, bought the front end, pretty much it's the same front end with an extra set of, um, pegs for the passenger. Um, for my size at five, eight, it's a little bit tricky steering it. I think I need to drill another hole and pull the front wheel a little bit closer to me because with the passenger, they put their legs up on the pegs and the pegs for me are much wider. So it's harder for me to push, you know, to turn, to do any extreme turns. So straight launch, no problem. My feet are on the pegs, but if I, you know, if I decided to, to work on it and get it dialed in for tandem, I'd probably drill another hole and pull the front wheel in a little bit more. That's pretty sweet, man, that you can take yeah. people up, give them rides. Um, that's kind of where I want to be in the near future. Um, one of my friends, two of my friends just got uh, a, a new tandem trike, man, and they're just absolutely loving it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. That, 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 that's got to be pretty cool to do. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm super stoked for that. I've done a lot of foot launch tandems and it's great, but I've also, you know, I've had all the mishaps that you classically hear about with, you know, passengers like you think they're out of their seat and they're not out of the seat, or you tell them, you know, 10 times, what's the one thing you're not going to do when we take off? You're not going to jump, right? You're not going to jump into your seat. And sure enough, they jump into the seat. It gets sketchy. You know, uh, I've landed on the beach and fallen over my passenger, you know, just crazy stuff. And I just love the idea of with the trike being able to just say, hey, click, click, click. Here's your selfie stick. Sit down. Here we go. Let's let's have fun, you know, and not have to give the whole briefing. And, you know, it's uh, I love it. It's still great being able to do it simply lightweight transports easy. But um, the trike is just going to make it so much easier. And I could take up people who are older who can't run. I could take up people who are heavier than me. Um, when I did my certification, the heaviest passenger was my instructor, Steve Reed, who weighs 185 and he's, you know, a foot taller than me. And that was definitely tricky, but, you know, I was kind of spoiled because he, as, you know, an instructor and a pilot himself who does tandems, he knew what to do. So, you know, you don't have to tell him like, you know, hold the bar to your stomach and run like a stodgy Englishman, uh, you know, upright without leaning forward, because if you lean forward, you're going to be kicking me while you run, you know, um, it was, I didn't have to deal with that, you know, so uh, it was a trip. When I went to Mexico last time, foot launch tandems, I think I did 25 tandems in a week. I met so many incredible people and the beach was fantastic. Um, but I think at home, the trike's going to make it a lot easier. And, you know, I'm, I'm transitioning out of my current business to try to, you know, make, you know, monetize flying a little bit more, teach a little bit more. And having the trike is going to be a huge part of that, I think, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm following, you know, I don't know if Noah Rochetta is one of the guys you're talking about as a friend who just got a trike, um, but he's, I've been kind of following his lead. We're very much on the same page with gear and teaching and everything. And uh, he just got the Phoenix trike with the Cosmo 300 on it. And I think I'm kind of following his lead. And I think that's what I'm going to wind up going with, you know, because um, I'm familiar with Power to Fly already. And I, I like what they put out. Yeah, I think these were fly products. Uh, I, I could be, could be wrong. Um, some beast of a tandem, yeah. Brooke, Brooke Sheffield and, and Derek yeah. Trout. Derek yeah. bought his through yeah, Tucker. Those are, on those, videos. Are great, those are great as well. I've, I've I've taken a look at those as well. Um, I think you know equally as good. You know, it's a beast, man. I mean, he put a two hundred fifty pound person in the front of it. It's just raw, straight up. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It's cool. I have um I have a BGD dual as my glider now. And um, Noah's been flying the light and the thing everybody always talks about with light gliders that they, they come up so easy, you know. And um, for me, when I was taking off foot launch, 
um, I'm, I'm taking off into some wind, like trying to foot launch in no wind is just, it's hell. So, um, it's nice. The idea of getting a lighter or smaller tandem wing than what I have, um, is also appealing. And I'm thinking about the, um, um, for the cyclone, I think it's a cyclone as well. Like getting a 38, that'll just make it easier. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions in or for the panel for Jared? Any questions that popped up in the chat? Well, All right. I got, I got I got one more question for you guys because I I've been seeing a lot of people um ask this question on the paramotor groups is that now that it's winter time you know i don't know what it's like where you guys are flying but what do you wear you know people are saying what do you use for powered you know gloves or socks or you know are you wearing a you know insulated flight suit where do you get these things you know and i've been i've been gearing people to go to um i wear a um, um a carhartt uh yukon uh, insulated flight suit, like just not a flight suit, uh, just what a coverall. And it works great. Two pairs of thermals, heated gloves, wool socks, um, and a hat under my helmet. And sometimes if it's super freezing, wear like a, a fleece neck cover, face cover. And um, it's really not that bad. I can stay up in the air plenty long without freezing. But uh, I just wonder what everybody else is doing. Interesting well, that you just said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm in Alabama. I wore heated gloves a day, and it was like 55 degrees outside. Uh, <laughs> Jim is in Canada. So I'll let oh, you know. 55 degrees. <laughs> but yeah, Jim. Yeah, Jim. Uh, tell us about your Canada flight, buddy. Jim, you're on mute. Still on mute. Well, there that'll you go. help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell tell us about flying in Canada and what do you wear because you know you're the one that we need to 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 follow. So I have a pair of cotton long johns or under long underwear, and then I wear a a wool undershirt. Hey, hey, hang on, hang on. Did you say a pair of cotton? <laughs> do, do you also use uh, a, a pair of socks <laughs> everything specialty in this sport right of course you know, they're, I know, pair, right? they're special yeah you betcha yeah. i got them from i love ppg.com Ooh, i like that what what, what, what was that again i i love ppg.com what was that clear that's, bro that's that's exactly where I get my pair of long johns and my pair of socks. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, so I wear, wear a wool undershirt and then uh, another cotton shirt and a sweater, like a sweatshirt. And then I wear a jacket on top of that. Not a really heavy jacket, but a wind blocking jacket. Huh. And it just... Uh, last flight i started with alpaca socks and i'll tell you oh, they make a big difference uh -huh. really nice cool and i've got a pair of negative 100 snow boots that that's 100 celsius and those things are the warmest boots i've ever had i tried them this time but they really changed my thrust angle it was a big difference. So I'm going to have to maybe change my hang point. Those boots are so heavy. Oh, mm -hmm. because they're so heavy, they change. Okay, okay, okay. I got you now. Well, yeah, I guess, didn't even think about that. The more stuff that you wear during the wintertime, it may change your hang point. Has anybody else uh, come across that? That's the first time that I, I even thought about that. Anybody else in the chat or the, the group here? Is that a big deal? I haven't had a problem with it up until I put these boots on. Once I put these boots on, oh, and also switch to an e-prop or a, not an e-prop, a carbon prop. So I lightened the back and then I threw a bunch of weight on on the front. And because they're the boots, they're way out in the front. I think that's part of why it's such so different. Huh. Interesting. How many people wear heated gloves and launch with the heated gloves on or do you not 
or do you launch barehanded and then put them on when you get up in the air? <laughs> I always said them. So cool. I, I get them warm before I put them on, yes. and then adjust them in the air. I usually set them on the lowest setting just so they so the battery stays on. And then if I'm up in the air, particularly my throttle hand gets cold, so I just I punch that up two notches to red, and then I do the same on the other side. And if I have to use my phone while I fly or whatever, I usually just take off the outer layer. I have a a, um, a liner on and that I can still grab, you know, the stylus pen or whatever, work my phone, and then put it back on. But it definitely helps to keep them, I think, to keep them, you know, warm all the time. Yeah, it takes, I, it takes I, some time to heat up, you know. I launch with gloves on and I have no problems with that. Anybody else launch with gloves? Yeah, yeah every time. Yeah. I have I have two layers of gloves. I got uh, the electric gloves and I leave them on pretty much all the time. And then I have uh, wind blocking Cabela's gloves uh -huh. over top of it uh -huh. with the touch ability for your phone. Uh -huh. And they work really, they work pretty good. But the cold transfers through the throttle, the metal throttle into uh -huh. my fingers. It So they don't block the cold that well. Wow. You get a me metal throttle? I, I bet that does make a big difference. The first time I took off with gloves and I did a reverse, I dropped a brake toggle because of the loss of dexterity. Yeah. Um, but now I've tried putting on the gloves. I had them in my pocket and I'm up there flying. It's like, oh, my hands are cold. Let me put them on. Well, the throttle hand, I mean, you basically have to take the throttle off of your hand and then work the glove on and then put the throttle back on. So yeah, you got to have enough glove. altitude that you just go into a glide, right? Yeah. It seemed like I never had enough altitude when I got in that situation. But, um, yeah, I always take off with them on yeah. if I'm wearing them. Yeah. Yeah, and I have a buddy who doesn't like how bulky the heated gloves are. So what he does is his, he puts on a liner, and he has leather gloves as an outer shell, and he takes a, the chemical warming packs, and he starts one up before we get going. Once it's <clears> warm, <throat> he stuffs it on the back of his hand, on, over the liner puts the leather glove on and that keeps some warmth in the glove and then he flies that way so his hand is unobstructed i've tried it it didn't really work for me uh, one of my instructors who suggested that said that because all the veins are on the top of your hand the blood flow will you know transfer the warmth to your fingers doesn't work for me <laughs> so I, I i don't know i have to i i kind of gotten used to putting up with the bulky gloves and just if i the the hardest part for me is the kill switch if i want to come in it's hard to kill it sometimes so i have to put my hands together or or kill it on my face or just something to you know so i have dexterity with the with the um or i should say with lack of dexterity be able to hit the kill switch with gloves on yeah i got these motion heat gloves uh -huh. And they are like, like wearing a glove. <laughs> oh, cool. They're so like, you can see that there's like no difference almost. Fits huh? like a glove. <laughs> you betcha. And then that's what this, this is just like another light glove. Huh? And it just slips right over top. So the liner is heated. Pardon? The liner itself is heated. Yeah. Okay. This is this is the heated glove right here. Okay. And cool. then this is just a uh, wind blocking shell that I got. Uh huh. And they're not the Cabela? warmest. The, the yeah, the, this the, one's from Cabela. What's the other one from? This is called Motion Heat, and it's okay. uh, a company out of Calgary, Alberta. Okay. And but I be I believe they're in the states as well. How long yeah, do the batteries yeah. typically last? They say eight hours. Wow. I've I've run out of battery, but that's because I didn't I didn't charge it a couple times before I was out. Yeah, that's eight hours. Even two hours would be great. I mean, for me, mine lasts an hour, maybe hour and a half if if they're on the lower setting, but uh, an hour at best if they're in the high setting. These will last no problem. Two hours on the high setting. Cool. Okay. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to get some, just when you go to Google and you do an Amazon search or whatever, um, Google heated glove liners versus heated gloves, and they're super thin, and there's a heater element that runs around the perimeter of each finger, keeping it okay. nice and warm. And tell me so, the name of that brand again of that of that particular one. 
this this yeah. one is motion heat motion heat. okay i'll check that out thanks man you're welcome yeah just be ready to spend a couple hundred bucks yeah, or euro, I mean, or yeah wherever you're at. I, I bought the the cabela ones were about 200 bucks and and um those are the best for me in terms of how supple they are with the soft leather on the inside but the I bought a pair at Home Depot of the Milwaukee gloves because they were on sale. And honestly, they get warmer and they la the batteries last longer, but they're classically way too bulky. I hardly ever use them unless the other batteries are dead in my other ones. So it's nice these to ones, know about those. These ones also have a system where you can put elements through your jacket. Uh -huh. So they got an extra plug-in right here, and then it, it goes right through your jacket and you can... Cool. Yeah, it's kind of neat. I haven't got the jacket though. Uh -huh. I should. <laughs> yeah. Hey man, if you're in where in Canada are you? Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, wow. Yeah, if it's that cold, you need it. I mean, especially if you're gonna do longer flights. I'm looking forward to new lows. Uh -huh. I'm still waiting on somebody to come out with a paramotor that's got an alternator built into it that can power all of our devices. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, our yeah, heating gloves, cool. our cameras. I mean, how much crap electronics do we carry with us nowadays? Yeah. Some of us more than others, but I mean, yeah, it's well, got to be possible. I think it'll be great when we have electric paramotors that can do that and we have solar fabric wings. Yeah. So the solar fabric will power the motor and it'll be quiet and we can fly as long as we want, as long as the sun's shining. You're going to build the first perpetual engine in theory, right? Oh, it'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Somehow I lost video. Let's see. So when you search for heated glove liners, where do you search? Do you search on Amazon or someplace else? I found mine on Amazon. Did you? Okay. I, I, f I found a pair that was like $25. It wasn't the liners, it's the actual gloves. And they work great. The battery lasts for a couple hours on high. And I've had them for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, other than when it drops below freezing, uh, they seem to be okay. And, and for 25 bucks, you really can't beat it. Yeah. All right. Um, any other cold weather gear information that we must know about? Because it is getting colder out there. Hey, Brian. That, uh, that that is a thing on uh, the EFI units um, that uh, they have an alternator on it and a, a battery pack to buffer. Mine was never set up like that, but it was a thing you could do is you could uh, uh, splice off the, the EFI battery pack that's used to, to fire the uh, injector. And you could use that to supply all sorts of um, extra stuff. Was, is that battery you know. pack? Oh, supplied power from the engine itself or is it something you had to charge say that again was that battery pack powered by the engine itself when it ran or was it something that you had to charge um i would keep it charged i would run it like on a trickle but uh yeah it had an alternator on the engine okay and you, yeah it's charging from the engine um i i tried to not stress it too much you know that's why i would trickle it beforehand make sure it was uh, uh up tip top shape but a lot of people don't do that it's not really necessary no um, man i want like a subwoofer a boom box <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta i gotta have the big alternator on mine <laughs> but yeah it looks like an actual just like a little rc motor and it, it's uh wedged up against the the belt and uh it just spins it and it's like wired backwards that uh you know the, the belt speed um, and it pumps voltage right back into the system. It's it's pretty pretty slick actually. I I feel like we're right around the corner for uh, some nice uh, upgrades in tech in in our engine world. I think Viterazi, once they get a good handle on it, I think uh, I don't know if it's like uh, I know they were talking about releasing an EFI unit. I haven't heard much about it other than um, a while back when they said they uh, they won like a competition with it. Um, a slalom competition, I think. But I'd really like to see some more uh, increases in tech. Not you know, not just uh, electric paramotors, but but more efficient uh, 
you know, uh, internal combustion paramotors. I think that'd be awesome. So yeah, agreed. Rather than have to get a bigger gas tank, you know, yeah, exactly. we'll stay up in the air longer. Just just do better with you know, be more efficient with the fuel that we have. I think can go a long way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like like we said, you know, uh, electric paramotors that have solar powered uh, or solar panels in the wings. I mean, that sounds freaking amazing. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah, I, well, I think Kevin can fly just nailed it in the chat. Said we, we need a lightweight four stroke engine that's super reliable. They're low maintenance. Um, it's, it's kind of a unicorn right now, but mm -hmm. I think Sean's probably taking notes because I think he's wanting to design his own paramotor. And, yeah, uh, we're we're definitely looking into uh, building our own paramotors. Um, a bunch of uh, us guys got together and started um, the flightbrothers.com. We're going to uh, try to get some um, new designs out there and try to <clears throat> trick out everything. So every paramotor that comes out has everything instead of, you know, um, getting it separately or a la carte so looking into it it's a lot more difficult than i thought the process is a lot it's a lot it's 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 insane it's stupid but um anyway um jared yes i know that moab was one of your favorite places how many states and countries have you flown in and what is your most favorite other than moab um, well, I've flown in the United States primarily. I flew, I had an opportunity a couple years ago to fly in Canada, actually up very close to Lake Huron. Um, and that was pretty mind blowing. Um, uh, I was staying at a place called Little Basswood Lake and I was flying, you know, I, I had been up there one time before and the terrain was beautiful, but I had no idea how many lakes were in the area until I got up in the air and it just blew my mind um but just you know flying over you know amish farms and long train tracks you know deep in you know between uh tall pine trees and then hopping over to lake huron where the water is as smooth as glass and you could see clear down to all these formations under the water again lots of people hanging out on their porches out on the houses you know all waving and um industrial sites to fly over um and um gosh that was just one of the best I, I would say also in my top three up in canada on lake huron um but um let's see um as far as other places uh i don't know i dream you know i i the last couple years i've been saying my bucket list i have friends who've been to iceland so for me, it's Iceland, Costa Rica, and Bali, Indonesia are three places that I'm hoping within the next two years, I'll get a chance to fly. Um, they've just been places that I've, I haven't visited Iceland, but I've been to, I've been to Bali a couple times and um, been to Costa Rica. And I know that there's a flying crew. I know Matt Minyard goes down there with the crew. And at some point, maybe I figured I'd either join him or find out where he's flying. And then uh, Iceland, of course, is, you know, like the paramotor dream. So I'm thinking at some point. Um, I've looked at a couple of videos recently of people flying in Egypt over the pyramids, and that looks really appealing too. But, you know, half the things I read are, yeah, it was an amazing experience. And half the other stuff I read is, oh, it was, it was a really sketchy group I went through. Or, you know, you're not sure if you're going to be able to rent gear that's reliable. Or, um, I don't know, I'd have to do more research to really find uh, the right group to go with for a trip like that. I think. I'm guessing you, you've heard of one-up adventures. One-up. Yeah, I think I have. Okay. Cause, cause what you're talking about doing is exactly what they cater to, uh, oh. people trying to fly in other countries. Uh -huh. Um, and I'm pretty sure Matt, um, knows that whole crew too. Okay. So I'll yeah, you, you might want to look up that they're in Lake Wales. Um, they're located at the same airport that aviators at, uh -huh. and, uh, they, they do adventure flying. Um, so yeah, Travis Burns, um, uh, Kyle, uh, Mooney, uh -huh. um, th those are the people at one up adventures, reach okay. out to them and they can help you fly any of those places. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah, no, I love it. That's all bucket lifts list stuff that I've been wanting to do. Um, you know, even for me last year, I drove to Mexico. I have a toy hauler 
And I drove it down. I went to the Salton Sea fly-in, came home, grabbed all my stuff, turned right back around two weeks later, drove four days down to, you know, Puerto Vallarta area. Um, I figured I was going to do that instead of dealing with trying to fly a paramotor. I mean, I, I don't know how Matt Minyard and, and um, you know, Glenn Tupper do it, man, as far as getting away with flying with their motors and suitcases and not getting busted. I mean, I've been busted twice, you know, trying to fly into Mexico where, you know, I got extorted. Uh, I got hit for a huge fee the first time. Luckily I was able to talk my way out of it. Second time I got nailed for 160 bucks. Um, and when I went into, when I drove in last year, I drove through the border. I got, I stopped 20 miles in past Nogales and I got, Stopped by a custom agent who saw my paramotor in the truck and wanted a thousand dollars USD, saying, "Oh, the maximum you're allowed to travel with, for with recreational gear in Mexico is three thousand dollars. So I guess I'm going to have to charge you a thousand dollars." And I, uh, long story short, I talked her down to about half of that, and I figured, you know, it was going to be worth it just to have the motor. And uh, Got to where I was going. I got stopped a second time. You know, I got nailed for another hundred bucks. So it was six hundred bucks on the road in addition to gas, four day trip. You know, um, but I, I just the idea of traveling with a group where it's already set up, where you have a motor, or somehow your motor is shipped without hassle. You know, is is uh, very appealing to me at the moment. You know, I, this year going down to Mexico, I'm thinking about going down next month, and. Um, I, when I drove home last time, I brought my, my, um, my RS back with me and I was doing tandems with it down there. And now I'm thinking, gosh, I, you know, I almost wish I would have left it there and got something else here because now the, the thought of trying to get it through customs again is just not that appealing. And, um, so I'm trying to figure it out, but right before I jumped on with you guys, I was literally looking up FedEx and DSL and UPS and trying to figure out how am I going to afford to get my motor shipped to, you know, Puerto Vallarta area uh, and make it worth it. Um, and I haven't figured that out. I, with, um, with Alaska airlines, I, when I, when I did bring the motor and wings, it was like 75 bucks for every additional bag after the third one with the, with the class that I flew and with the card I used. Um, when I flew to that trip, when I went to Canada to Lake Huron area, I got nailed for 500 bucks for the paramotor. Uh, 250 bucks overweight, eight pounds overweight, and 250 bucks for oversized. It was in the mini plane soft case, and the the that one bag cost me more than the ticket to Chicago, so I had no other choice. So I, you know, I, hats off to Matt Minyard and those guys to be able to pull it off effectively. But man, it has not. I have not had that kind of luck. So it sounds like you were extorted, oh, yeah. uh, going north or south. Yeah. Um, what, what well, would your advice be to somebody that wants to go fly in Mexico? Um, well, as far as packing a motor, I would say you can do it. I, like I said, I've done it twice, but expect to have to pay a customs fee. Um, I think I just lost you. Oh, wow. Went to a weird screen. Um, yeah, we're in a classroom. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that, that's the thing. I mean, technically, when you travel into Mexico, they have a rule that basically says you're allowed to carry two pieces of sports equipment. You know, otherwise, if you carry more than two per person, they can charge you 16 percent of the total worth of your gear. And you might be able you might tell them, like, what happened to me with like they said, how much was this is this paramotor worth or this thing? And I said, oh, about a thousand dollars because I figured I was going to have to pay, you know a fee, a percentage of that. And while I'm talking to the guy, another guy looks up mini plane, says, oh, this is what this is. He shows it to me on his phone. Ah, $5,700. Well, that's what it would cost in Mexico. So we're going to have to charge you 16% of that. And, you know, half an hour later, after chatting back and forth, um, I talked him down, you know, um, it's kind of a, a longer story. I got out of it in the end because uh, the person who was walking me to the ATM didn't speak good English and I didn't speak great Spanish at the time. And um, I basically told the guy, listen, if I'm gonna give you, you know, 400 bucks cash, I want a receipt that shows that I paid this. And he was like, um, uh, $200 uh, receipt, 
or uh, uh, no receipt, four hundred dollars, you know, uh, receipt. And I was like, no, that's not how this is going to work. I need a receipt to show that this, you know, I paid, and that's not going to happen again. And the guy just after going back 10, 10 minutes back and forth, he couldn't get a hold of his boss, who was the one who sent me to the ATM with him. So he just said, you know what, you can go gratis. Um, you know, you might have a trouble getting back into Mexico again, but next time, but for now you can go. And I was like, Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and I just took off. And then when I went to go pick up my rental car, I told the guy the story and he was like, Oh man, they were totally just trying to jack you, you know? So it's good that you didn't pay it. But, um, the second time when I did get nailed, he charged me 16% of a thousand dollars. So he charged me, uh, you know, 160 bucks and I did pay with a credit card and I did sign it custom. So I knew at least that time it was legit, you know? Um, and the funny thing was at that time, I literally only had two pieces of sports equipment. I had a mini plane and one wing and I tried to tell him, you know, and he was like, Nope, he, he wouldn't let me go. Um, so I, I paid it. So as far as my advice to anybody who wants to travel, you know, at least into where I went through in Puerto Vallarta, just expect, you know, if you have your suit, if you have your, your motor in a bag, that's not, um, uh, if it's in a normal suitcase, say the way Minyard and, and, um, you know, Tupper did it, you might be able to get away with it. Mine was in a marked thing that said mini plane. It was a large case. Um, and the other thing is I got nailed because I'm a guy coming from the US and I had like six bags. I had my normal luggage, I had two wings, I had you know, uh, the motor and another suitcase that had you know, accessories, my helmet, my flight stuff. Um, so you know, if they see you going through customs, even if you hit the green light, they're gonna wanna pull you over because you're one person with all these bags. So travel, travel light, you know, if you can pack your paramotor, pack it with your clothes and stuff all in it. Um, take one wing and just call it good, and you know you might get through. Um, what what about if you if you fly your paramotor over the border? Is there is it different if you do that? Well, that's what I was talking about. Oh, you mean like literally fly over the border? You know, I don't yeah. know. I you know I, I kind of joke like if you really wanted to, you could make a killing being a para coyote. You know, <laughs> um, you know we were when on the way back driving, we were driving all along the ridiculous fence. You know, and and it was it was kind of creepy. Just you know how. There's, it's not just one fence, it's two with the no man's land in between. So it's, it's kind of a sketchy thought to, to, you know, I mean, if you went, if you went, you know, black wing, black paramotor, you know, doing it at night, you know, maybe with a mini plane that's quieter <laughs> or fly high altitude with no strokes, maybe you could do it, you know, but uh, I don't know. For, for guys who are living in Texas or along the border, you know, to be able to fly and land somewhere and have somebody pick you up, hey, more more power to you, man. Um, that'd be great. Yeah, I was actually has, just looking at – go ahead. Has anybody ever rented a paramotor? I've never rented one. I, I, I've thought about that, particularly if I was going to go to back to Indonesia because I know that there's a club there, but – all the honestly, I don't know about you guys, but all the videos I've seen of the guys who fly in Thailand, you know, no, no offense, but it's like some of that equipment looks pretty janky, man. I don't know if I'm going to fly over a volcano. I know I'm going to want to have a motor that I can trust. <laughs> so I don't know. I haven't done it yet. Okay. This year uh, for the Iceland trip, Mm -hmm. the, it's hosted by PPG School out of Regina or out of Canada up here. And Aaron Hackle is going to be hosting that for Scout. So that there's a bunch of us that are planning on going this year. To Iceland? Yeah. That sounds awesome, man. When, what time of year? What's the... I think he's got a multiple sessions all during the year so you can choose if you go to the it's scout web. ballpark price tag on something like that and I don't remember like exactly. all, all inclusive 10 grand right well I don't think it was quite that much it was like maybe four to seven depending on what you do wow including airfare uh, it might not include the airfare you might have to get there yeah. Yeah. I have a friend. I should ask him about it. My friend Skylar just went. 
um, a couple months ago and he had a fantastic time. Hmm. Well, with that type of money, it's like, I think I'd rather just buy another pair motor or a couple wings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For that kind of money, for sure. Yeah. You know, but the it's, whole you know, eastern, eastern side of the Mississippi river to explore too. And you can stay yeah. in the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's even a package where you can buy a new scout paramotor and you get a big discount <laughs> if you huh. go there. So you buy the you buy the paramotor and take it home with you? Yeah. Wow, I wonder it's, what the shipping is like on that though. You know, at the same <laughs> time. It was funny. I when I went the, with my Mexico trip, it was like getting into Mexico was the hellish part. Getting leaving, I left with six bags. They don't even question you coming back into the states. You know, nobody searched a thing, um, but going going into Mexico is where they nail you. So I imagine, you know, in a lot of countries when you're leaving to go in, that's probably what you got to be concerned about. That is so interesting. Um, I wonder, uh, anybody in the chat, have you tried to leave the United States with your paramotor and had to deal with something that Jared just was talking about? I'm curious about that. Um, anyway, uh, any more questions for Jared from the panel or anything that popped up in the chat? I, I'm, I'm just curious because um, I hear everybody talk about going to Mexico to fly. And there's there's mm -hmm. one reason behind it, um, usually, is they want to fly at night with a full moon. And in Mexico, I've been told we can do that legally there. Um, is that something you've looked into while you were there or do you know anything about it? Um, I have a friend who recently flew by a full moon. Um, the, the way to do it, and this we, I tried to do it in Moab. Um, it didn't really work from where the, with the terrain and the, the conditions we were flying in. But um, in, in Mexico, if you, the way to do it from what I'm told is to you know, fly before the sun gets up. So you know, if, this, if the moon's high in the sky, you take off in the morning and then you fly, then the sun comes up and then you can see the beach pretty clearly. Um, you can I have actually gotten stuck flying in the dark, like pitch dark in Mexico. And the thing is, if the moon is out, the, the beauty of it is this, the sand is pretty white. So you get a, enough reflection that you can kind of see where you are and there's no power lines or obstructions on the beaches. Um, luckily at the time when I was there, um, the guy who was in front of me had strobes on. So I was kind of following him over the land. And then Dan, oddly enough, Dan Dimov was living on uh, what used to be a private airport. So when he found out what was going on, his daughter flipped the lights on and we actually had a lit LZ to land in. Um, so we were super lucky because it was freaking dark. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, as far as, you know, the, the classic thing is the same as it is here. It's, it's always about, you know, no matter what the rules, it's always who's complaining, right? So it's like the idea of flying over a congested area, it's like what's congested, it's a gray area. It could be one person who's complaining. So it's, you know, there, if you don't piss anybody off, you take off on the beach and there's vacation homes. And, you know, if, if somebody's upset with that, that you're taking off, waking them up to go fly on a full moon, you might have a problem, but you know, if not, then yeah, I mean, it's, it's nobody legally, you know, you're not going to get in trouble, but they could always find a way to get you, you know, if they want to get you in trouble, you know, um, especially being from another country, not native, you know, they could nail you. Um, hey, that's going to cost you a thousand dollars for flying at night right yeah. there. Right. Exactly. Because exactly. wow. yeah. you're in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned seeing the ground or the reflectivity. I'm guessing depth perception might have been the issue, seeing how far you were above the ground. Yeah, essentially it's that. It's, you know, ideally also obstructions. I mean, that's why typically we don't fly in the dark, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. amazing. So you you want to be able to see, gauge your distance to the ground. You know, in particular places, you want to absolutely make sure you're not going to run into power lines or obstructions you just can't see. Um, but on the beach, you know, if there's a nice wide beach and it's, you know, there's moonlight, you can usually see the sea foam on the tide and you can see the beach enough. Your eyes do acclimate. Um, it just takes some time, you know, 
but yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the perks. I haven't done it yet, but I, you know, if I'm going to be there, as long as I'm hoping to be there this, this winter, then yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably try it at some point. Has anybody flown a uh, half an hour after sunset and landed right at that 30 minute mark and then looked around and he's like, I don't even know how I can get my paramotor, my wing put together and, and, and leave. That's one of the reasons why I don't fly that late is because you just can't see to pack up. Anybody else have that uh, issue? Or does anybody fly that late? Yeah, yeah just the other night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What happened, Will? Well, I mean, it's just as just as you said. I mean, it's pitch black. It's amazing uh, how dark it is and how lenient the uh, our regulations let us fly. But I, I've got a good uh, strobe light that also turns into a you know, just a regular flashlight type thing. So I've got plenty of light. But it's the landing that always throws me off. The flare, you know, the difference in perception, and <laughs> yeah, every freaking time, man. Even though I know it's coming, it's just it's freaky, you know. Yeah, it's totally freaky. I mean, I, I'm in Mexico. I have a, my unit has PPG lights on it, so it's kind of like a disco party. If it's dark, you know, the I leave it on. <laughs> all the kids start running over and you know trying to talk to me and. It's pretty fun. The issue for me more so, honestly, at you know, landing at dark, like you can see, but the issue isn't not being able to pack up because you can't see. It's because everything gets wet. You know, usually it's just everything is so humid that you're packing a wet wing, you know, and that's kind of a drag. So for me, the when I'm there, usually my my protocol is I pack it up, I load it out, and when I get back to camp. I open up the bag and first thing in the morning when it starts getting warm, I just lay the whole wing out. I shake the sand out of it. I have a little toothbrush that I use to get the sand out of my magnets and just kind of kite the wing and just get it crispy again. Um, but it's that's typical. Like after sunset, especially like I was mentioning, the, the beauty of it there at times, if the if the season is right, it's like clockwork. Every sunset, you get this marine layer that comes in and it's epic to fly at sunset you're flying you know all the tops of the clouds are turning pink and curling and you're flying through all these amazing channels but it, it's humid you know so you land on the beach and your wing is definitely damp um so that's that's kind of the protocol is you know in the morning just lay it out or kite it to get it crispy again there, there's a benefit to that too i mean i don't know I'm, I'm sure this has happened to you but many many times i have landed you know, plenty of light and everything. And then I see the most beautiful freaking sunset. Oh yeah. man, that would be beautiful to be up yeah. there, you know? Totally. But, but, but not by that time, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm done. But yep. you know, I, I did have a question, Sean, that I wanted to ask Jared. Um, you, you know, sure, if, sure. It does, if it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger, right? So what's the, you have any like scary, the, the scariest learning type experience? Uh huh. From all all of your uh, travels. Yep. It, well, as far as flying, you mean, or or yeah, actually flying. Flying, flying, flying. I can say one of the things that scared the bleep out of me last year was, you know, it's funny to tell this story this way. It's like my first two years of paramotoring, I kind of joked that I was a master at zero pendulum. Like I didn't swing left or right. I had great throttle control. I didn't. I didn't. You know porpoise at all. I was like super, super conservative. And then, you know, what got me started learning wing overs and, and rolls was um, in Mexico, actually, flying down the beach in laminar wind, swinging back and forth a little bit at a time and doing, doing passes up and down the beach. The funny part of the story was, you know, when I got really excited about it, I did four passes up and down Sayulita Beach. And by the end, I was at motion sickness. I was like nauseous. I didn't even know that I, that would happen to me, you know. But um, I wound up you know, over the course of about a week in practicing, I started getting over it. And I always used to say at that point, I love getting horizontal. I love, you know, I want to learn like slalom like turns because I like being sideways you know, but I have no desire at all whatsoever to go upside down ever, you know, and I can say in the last 18 months, I, you know, learning barrel rolls, I'm obsessed with it, you know, so now, you know, and of course my paragliding instructor with everything would say to me, you know, I, I'd be like, yeah, Kevin, I just got a smaller wing. And he goes, 
of course you did. You know, I was like, you know, and now I'm really obsessed with flying up sound. He goes upside down. He goes, of course you are. <laughs> you know, like just that evolution of like being really conservative and then baby steps, learning a little bit more and becoming more and more confident, you know, um, over time. But um, anyway, so my story goes, last year, I started really getting into barrel rolls, and I started learning how to do it in Mexico. And I got myself, um, after after the Salton Sea, I got myself my Luna 18. I'd been flying a 20 for uh, just over a year. And I was playing around, doing much bigger wingovers, and I decided to go for it. And I'd say maybe my third or fourth attempt at a barrel roll, I wound up the scariest thing as far as answering your question was I wound up maybe maybe a thousand or eight hundred feet above the beach where my friends were kiting down below and my I had you know lots of people I knew down there who were watching me. Um, I wound up in a face down spiral, like a death spiral, and I did two rotations so fast it scared the crap out of me. And um I lucked out because I had one of those oh crap moments where I, I, I pulled right. I did a right, right barrel roll and I had a brain fart and I was like trying to get out of it, but I kept pulling right. So I kind of locked myself into it and I'm pulling, pulling, pulling. And at that moment, in that split second, you know, time slows down. I look at my reserve handle. I look at the power lines in the houses down below me and know my friends are on the beach and all the stuff that's crossing my mind, like, well, if I survive this, it's going to be really embarrassing. And I'm going to wind up in a freaking power line or in a house down there. And it's going to be a mess. And I did one last ditch effort. And for whatever happened, my left hand yanked and I pulled out of it and I spun away. And um, I was in this state of shock and kind of denial. Like, like I, I wanted, I was, it was, I was, had been up in the air 10 minutes and what I, what was going to be like a two hour plus flight. And I just told myself, you know, I didn't want to think about, it. I, I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to think about this. I just, I'm just going to be really careful on this flight. Now this, this was the sign, you know? Um, so, but what I learned from that experience and practicing was from that point on, anytime I tried a barrel roll, I would say out loud or mark in my head, like actually say to myself, pull right, counter left, or pull left, counter right. Like I'd say it. So I knew that I was completely focused and I was very present with what I was about to do because I, you know, that was what, what scared me was I, in that moment, just did not, I just, like I said, I had a blank spot. I was really excited. I did what I did and I wasn't thinking about how to follow through. And that's why it was so scary and so dangerous. So that's the long story. And have you ever done an SIV course? I have. I did um, an SIV actually two years ago in Yalapa with Fabul Herrera. And I didn't do any acro maneuvers, but I did all this, you know, classic stalls and spins. And, you know, regarding that, the um, everybody thinks that the scariest thing you're going to do is a stall. You know, like you're going to collapse the wing and you're going to, fall free fall and you're gonna have your stomach in your throat and it's a scary roller coaster experience for me it wasn't like that it was the stall was not the scariest maneuver the stall was like i didn't ever feel like i was in free fall i mean i i was um i was on an a wing in the in the in the uh, class and i felt like i was getting jostled around i i twisted a little bit and i corrected but it happened so fast i never got that lump in the throat kind of feeling the scariest thing that happened was this, the face down spiral and all the G that I felt because at one point and there's a video, you know, on my if you look up on my site, there's like uh, two videos and there's a spin. The second one I did was an accident. I was supposed to do uh, a reverse. He called it where you collapse, say, the right side and you you get that sense that you fall, you're twist, you're you're turning backwards. That's why they call it a reverse. It's basically um uh, you're just collapsing one side of the wing with the brake. And what happened was I wasn't familiar with the maneuver and I wasn't clear on what Fabu was telling me. So instead of pulling quickly and popping the wing, I pulled slowly and I kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in the spiral. And I was really upset because Fabu didn't say anything, but I was um, until after the fact when I, I let go of it myself. But um, what happened was I felt so much G that 
I literally felt my eyes starting to close and I yelled at the top of my lungs. And it's kind of funny to watch now in the video, but I just, I let it out. And I was, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. And he gets on the radio and goes, so Jared, that was a really good example of a spin, but I need to see a negative. So set up and do it again. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you know? So he, I, you know, he basically told me, you know, grab the riser, pull hard, fast. So that's what I did. And I, I wound up completing the maneuver, but um, that was my SIV experience. I mean, I did all the, all the things we need. Actually, it's funny. I, I have the certificate right here. You know, I keep it in, in my, in my window, but uh, now as far as SIV and, and having really gotten into the barrel roll thing, I've been hanging out with um, an amazing uh, instructor, paragliding instructor, um, and it's been, I've had this great experience with him. His name is Harrison Ruffin from, um, uh, a, uh, Astro PPG in Bend, Oregon. And he's an acro pilot and he does free kiting clinics at, uh, Cape Kiwanda on the coast, uh, in the summertime. And I signed up for one of his clinics cause I wanted to learn how to do ground helis. Um, and just from hanging out with him and all the things that I've learned, I kind of call what we do at some points in high winds Kung Fu kiting, because it get, it's really fun to like, you know, do on, per se on my BG, I have a BGDC to a kiting wing, and it's gotten really fun to throw the thing side to side, wingtip touching back and forth to the point where you literally jump off the ground and you know, grab the lines and come down. So you're kind of like flying down the beach in this kind of martial artsy kind of way. Um, but uh, Harrison's got me, you know, really interested in potentially doing some, some, you know, more acro stuff. I, I mean, I, th I've been wanting to learn sats forever. And you know, when I watch people do them, like if you watch Tucker Gott do it or Judson or you know, all these guys, they make it look so easy and so benign. And that's what most people who do them say it is, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that I want to learn in SIV. So that's one of my plans for the spring is to hook up with Harrison, um, really get into doing a lot more stalls and getting comfortable in face down spirals and, you know, doing all the prep work to do it comfortably and really, really conscientiously and safely. So that's kind of, that's my trajectory, I think. Interesting. How do yeah. you ease in? You, you're talking about easing into things. So, for a barrel yeah. roll example, uh, as uh -huh. an example, how would you ease in to learning how to do a barrel roll? I mean, at some point, you know, yeah. it's got to happen. So, I guess yeah. you all the how do you do that? Um, for me, it was just like I got. I started out like I said in in Mexico, and laminar wind was very predictable. Um, I started just swinging back and forth. And then at one point I was like, okay, I got my swings up pretty high. I'm going to turn around when I do it. So you get to the top and you make sure you're feeling break and you make your turn. So you start getting into doing wing overs. And then once you have wing overs big, the way I kind of, you know, went for it was you at the top of the wing over, if you have a lot of momentum, you know, you, let's say I'm doing I'm doing a wing over to the left or, or I want to do a barrel roll to the left. I'd pull left, um, add a little bit of throttle and you know make sure that the wing is completely loaded. And then as I get to the top, make sure I'm holding my right enough that it's not going to release. And then before you know it, you're all the way around. And what it's all about really is managing the energy coming out of it. So what, what winds up most of the time happening to me, or I should say all the time, well, most of the time, is I you make the turn, you flip over, and you wind up in a spiral. So it's just a matter of tapering off the energy in a spiral. So a lot of times I wind up doing one full turn and then coming out, going in, and I'm straight again. So it's just a matter of, one, doing them up high, you know, especially on a smaller wing, because, you know, you wind up losing a lot more altitude than you might think you would. Um, I've done it where I wind, I wound up not managing the energy well enough, and I'm winding up face down, and I'm not spiraling, but I'm diving, you know, so it's just a matter of um, feeling your wing loading with your hands and weight shifting and get to, to manage getting out of the turn, you know, or to out of the out of the dive. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, um, there, there's actually a really good video. Judson had had. Um, I don't know if he made it in a video or he had a commentary where he he discussed the process really step by step. You know, similar to what I did, probably better than what I did in terms of how to go through the the motions. But um, it is one of those things that is, you know, once you get to big wing overs, like you said, it's, you know, it's not that much more to just go for it, add a little bit of throttle, push yourself over, and then manage it coming out. Absolutely. Hey, Jared, real quick, uh, JP's yeah. got to go, but he's going to do a, a, a screenshot for us. So let's do a sure. thumbnail, uh, okay. thumbs yeah. up or cheese or pom poms or whatever you want to do. JP, let us know when you're going to give us a, a, snap, a snapshot. Ready? Cool. One, two, three, cheese. Excellent. Good cool. deal. Oh, that was, that looked really good. Usually hey. everybody's like moving. You guys did good on that. Everybody was, they did. <laughs> Either that or my my screen froze. Your, your, right your screen froze time. perfectly at the right time. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, JP. JP. Yeah, thank you, JP, for hanging out with us. Appreciate you, buddy. Love you, man. Oh, always a pleasure. I will catch you guys on the next uh, the next one. Right on, man. That's good, bud. Thanks, JP. Take care, man. Peace out. See ya. <clears throat> All right. So, anybody else need to go? We're, we're I, I mean, my goodness, we're, we're at uh, it's eight twenty one p.m. We've been talking for almost an hour and a half. Holy smokes! Oh, wow. cool. uh, we've been rolling tonight. Anybody else got to go, or can we? You know, and still chat for a little bit, or what? I got, right. I got a few more minutes. Um, yeah, we're at six twenty one where I am, so it's not quite. It's getting around dinner time. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Jared, I, I just gotta say, man, I, I feel like I'm kind of right there where where you were with the with the wing overs at this point, and I haven't fully done a barrel roll yet, committed to it. Uh, I've I've seen my shadow about the midpoint of the wing huh? in the, the late afternoons, and there's sometimes when I pull that last wing over, I, I just kind of go around and do yeah. kind of a dive, and then come out of it, try to manage the energy. I feel like I'm so close to like getting to where I want to be. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for me? I would say just just know that, you know, you see a lot of pictures of barrel rolls and I, you know, with an Insta360, when I fly, it's so easy to kind of realize that you could manipulate it to make it look like you're really upside down, you know, relative to the horizon. But the fact is, you know, actually, my friend Kevin mentioned a lot of times barrel rolls, you're not necessarily upside down like feet to the sky. You're just going all the way around and you're at an angle. So what's going to happen is as you start to learn, that's what it's going to be. You're pretty much just looping around. And then over time, you know, I, I think the funnest and safest times I'm doing barrel rolls are when there's a lot of wind and I'm either going upwind and I, my wing is completely loaded and I have enough if you give yourself enough momentum to swing and get around upwind, or if you're flying very fast downwind and you're up high, doing a barrel roll is actually really easy because you just pull and you have so much momentum and your wing is so loaded, you just wind up going around with hardly any effort. Um, at least that's my experience. Um, but the key thing I would say is just make sure that you're always, your hands, you're always feeling the wing. Because the, the main thing that can happen, and I have I have wing tip deflations all the time doing it. And, and I with my 18 particularly, I feel most safe because I know that that wing's even more loaded than my 20 when I do it. Um, but if you feel a little deflation, it's not that big of a deal. A lot of times it'll pop right back open. Um, but it's, it's really all about making sure you're feeling your um, particularly the outer the outer um, tip. So if you're pulling right to go, make sure you've got some pressure in the left. You know what I mean, or and vice versa. Um, and just how heavy and also are you loaded on your wing? say again. How heavy are you loaded on your wing? Um, I'm pretty much on the 18. It's funny because the 18 is rated the same weight rating as the 20, and I'm about in the middle of the range, I think, on the Luna. Um, I haven't done barrel rolls on my Roadster uh, 24. I just feel like it's almost too much energy for me to manage. You know, I, I, um, I'm sure it can be done, but I have had a frontal doing wing overs on the roadster. So I kind of got freaked out by that. Um, uh -oh. yeah, that, that's kind of a really, I, it's kind of a, a stupid story in terms of uh, newbie mentality. I could tell, um, the one time I had that catastrophic, scary, uh, 
uh, frontal was, uh, you know, uh, asymmetric frontal. Um, I'll tell the story and it, it's not really PC, but it's kind of ridiculous. Um, it's, it's ultimately me being the worst stupid you can be in terms of not thinking ahead. But for the for the my first two years, I didn't fly with a reserve. I just never thought that I would need one at the time. Like I said, I was a master of zero pendulum. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to be in any condition where I'm going to need a reserve. You know, I'm not doing anything scary. So didn't think about it. And then my buddy Ryan, who I, I helped get started, he wound up training with the same guy I did. He initially he had been a hang glider. So he he was he always just felt more comfortable flying with a reserve. The issue for me with Ryan was Ryan is 15 pounds heavier than me. We had the exact same mini plane, exact same roadster, right? Um, and uh, what wound up happening was I got tired of following Ryan all the time. He was always five miles an hour faster than me on the same gear because he's heavier. So, and he's, he's flying with the reserve. So, you know, so I was like, I'm going to buy myself a reserve. I buy the reserve took it out of the package, didn't even think about how to hook it up. What I did was when we got out to the field, I threw the damn thing under my seat as a weight. You know, I didn't even think I was going to need it. And um, I, th it was that very flight. We flew into the late morning in the Lorraine Valley. And I, I, we were on our way back from like a two hour flight to Fern Ridge Reservoir. It was an epic flight. And I'm up high and I'm flying over a friend's house and he's down below. And there, there was a cannabis farm right next door, right? So we're like checking out all the weed, you know, everything's, you know, it was just this fun flight. And I decide I'm going to bank a turn flying over my friend Tim's house. So I bank a turn, I smack right into thermal air and I get this frontal. And I was on wing, I was on my tips, actually. I wasn't, I was in reflex mode. I was on my tips instead of on my brakes. So I make this right turn and, um, I get a, a full on asymmetric frontal. I swear I dropped at least 150 feet. I'm screaming into the, to, to the mic, you know, to Ryan, oh, I got a frontal, I got a collapse, you know? So he's like, are you all right? Are you all right? And I'm falling. Next thing I know, it pops out. I did the right thing. I leaned in the direction of the side of the wing that was flying and it popped out and I flew out. I flew away like 50 feet over the tree line. And the lesson in that was if you're carrying a freaking reserve, put it on, <laughs> you know, and the <laughs> other thing is the, the other, the other thing was, um, hang on a second. Um, the other thing was at the time was don't bank any huge turns, you know, without using my brakes and feeling pressure in thermal air, you know, so that was, that was the lesson learned. So ever since then, and that was a year into flying. I'm flying, you know, almost over six years now. I haven't flown without a reserve since. Um, and my flying has become a lot more aggressive, but I feel a lot more comfortable with a reserve. Um, so why did I get into telling you that story? I don't even know. But that was kind of a crazy one. That was, a, that was one of those, you know, 101 stupid things to do. It's like the one time I had a frontal. I had a reserve and it wasn't connected. You know, it's just stupid. Well, well I was curious because I'm a, I'm on a spider 26 meter. And after uh -huh. I added the retracted track wheels and put on a few pounds, I'm uh -huh. basically a hundred percent loaded on my wing. Uh -huh. I was, I was, I was 101% loaded when I added the retracted track. I was scared to fly it after talking to some people. Um, I flew it and I'm flying it and I love it. It's uh -huh. very dynamic. But uh, it, and that wing feels like it wants to come around. It's a big wing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, with, with I, the trike on or without the trike on? Like, if you wanted to try, when you're doing big wing overs, are you wearing the trike or no? Yeah, yeah, okay. I am. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's to retract the trike. It only weighs 21 pounds. Uh -huh. So uh, you know, as soon as I take off, the front wheel comes underneath, and it's basically just like a foot launch unit at that point, as far as weight shift and whatnot. Right. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, I can't tell that it has a significant, uh, impact on the, the di dynamics of how it flies basically, uh, -huh. uh from foot launching, but it was just enough additional weight that I had to change my hang point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say if you're going to try, you know, like I said, with a barrel roll, it's like, make sure you have altitude, 
feel your brakes and, you know, don't be so concerned about going full on upside down at first. If you go all the way around that technically that's a roll. Um, and gradually you'll get more and more comfortable, you know, going all the way around more vertical. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, like I, I tell people who ask me about the same thing, it's like baby steps, like, you know, do it when you, when you're, when you're present of mind and you know what you're doing and you, you know, the conditions are good, you know, um, that's, that's, that's what I would tell anybody regarding flying about anything. It's like, you really have to be present. And if you're going to take risks, take calculated risks, you know, know what you're going to do. Like uh, I, I just, I see a lot of people recklessly flying or talking about flying so recklessly. And honestly, as an instructor at this point, I can't help but criticize, you know, like, come on, you know, you know, we get into arguments about being an ambassador for the sport or, you know, just the reputation of people flying. Um, it's about, to me, just about being conscientious with other people and, and yourself and what you're doing. Cause all these things, it's like, you see people doing mind blowing tricks and all this incredible flying and diving and skimming and, you know, wingtip touching on the ground and all that. And it's not, if you're, if you're doing it intentionally and you have developed the skills over time, in my opinion, then, Hey man, more power to you. It's really fun to watch. You know, there's certain things I have no desire to do at this point, but that, as I said, and I joked earlier, that could change over time. You know, the more confident you become and the more skills you legitimately achieve, I think uh, it just kind of, it's part of the process. You know where I am on on wing overs. I I mean I I can do what I consider you know decent wing overs. You know I'll start I'll start small oscillations what? back and forth and I get it going really good. But, yeah. But you know one I get to one of them and I'm like man I know what's coming. I got a yeah. lot of freaking energy. Yeah. And if yeah. I start coming back, you know. So how would it would it be better at that point to come back and then just kind of go into a turn a turn to dissipate the energy or or use, you know, uh, counter it with a little break or. So you're saying like, if you're, if you're at the top of a wing over. Uh, you're at the top of a wing over, but you've been, yeah. you know, they've been progressively getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. it's the, that one where, okay, I'm no, I'm not comfortable anymore. Cause I know that yeah. I've got all this yeah. energy coming back. Well, that, that's, that is the point. That's where it's like, okay, if you've got a lot of energy and you're about to swing up and I mean, and you could go over that's the point where you just commit, like I'm holding it. And, you know, uh, you can add a little bit of throttle to actually increase your, increase the push in your loading. But the main thing at that point is like with wing overs, you always have to watch that outer break because that's what'll get you. That's where the collapse will happen when it goes weak. So if you're pulling hard and you've got a lot of pressure on your right, say going right, make sure your left hand is still feeling pressure. There are times when I do barrel rolls on the on the smaller wing where honestly it almost feels like I have equal pressure in both as I'm going over. You know, it's like I it, I, it just becomes second nature to like to feel that tension. You know, so it's equal or it's even. So as you go over, it's like pull more pressure, more pressure, release. You know, it just you just go around, but you you just want to make sure you got you're holding the wing you know, so it doesn't have the chance to release. At least that's and, my experience. Yeah. And here's something else too, Will. Um, try this before you start doing wing overs. Do yourself a 360, right? So, um, you know, do yourself a 360, but as you're doing your 360, pull both of your brakes in at the same time and you'll feel yourself doing a 360 uh, spiral a lot quicker. Um, and that's the way to do it when you're doing that 360s you pull both the brakes now when you're doing your wing over feel the broke both the brakes also you'll be able to feel that uh you'll be able to feel it a little bit on on both your brakes when you're doing your wing over or barrel roll yeah so you try to get any slack from, from on the outside wing you don't want any slack in the in right the lines right weight shift is also really important that's you know from from free flying recently that's one of the things that i'm really having to relearn because I, at this point, I honestly don't feel as comfortable doing wing overs without the motor as I do with the motor. Because with the motor, you have the crutch of being able to throttle up and add a little bit of loading to your wing. Whereas with, you know, without the motor, 
so much is about timing. You know, they say that um, small wing overs and large wing overs are not the problem in terms of the danger. It's the medium wing overs where you don't have enough pressure or enough momentum to complete the maneuver. So, you know, what I'm what I was told is if you want to learn wing overs without the motor, you should learn to swing and do them without using your brakes. Just really work on your weight shift and and get the timing drilled into your physical body so it's second nature where you're weight shifting naturally. And it, I think it goes the same with the with the motor wing overs. It's like when you lean in and you you know to to get your momentum going. It, it's it definitely helps, you know, it, and, and every, everything just kind of feels more natural, I think. At least that's how I see it. Um, so weight shift definitely plays a role. That helps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, I, this is always it's always you're always learning, right? Like, I, you know, it's funny because as I'm teaching more, I'm also having to rethink how to communicate these things because I fly way more than I teach and so many things just become second nature. And then you have to kind of recalculate how to express those things, you know, to, to transmit the energy and, and, or, or I should say, uh, make it understandable to somebody else. Exactly. I, that's I, like, I, that's I, like trying to explain how to walk correctly. It's like, I've been walking forever now. Yeah. Let me try to figure out how to tell you how to walk. Right. It's yeah, yeah, kind of difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's great. It, I feel like teaching is making me a better pilot as well, because it's making me really have to think through and articulate every single movement in motion, you know, um, and it just makes me that much more conscientious when I fly. So it's well, good. So, so now three things. One is, yeah, yeah teacher learns a lesson the best, right? And yeah. two is you're doing an awesome job, you know, articulating, explaining it. So that's awesome. Cool. And then I guess number three is I need to take the uh, reserve out of my car and put it on my paramotor. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea, especially if you're going to be practicing wing overs. Are you, are you serious, Will, or are you just joking? I'm dead serious. I, that, wow. When I first got it, that's where, that's where I put it, and that's where it is today. <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Real quick, real quick, how many people here on the panel, the, the, the six people here, how many people fly with the reserve? How many people have a reserve and don't Put it use in it? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, how about in the chat? How about in the chat? You guys that are still in the chat, I definitely appreciate you still hanging out with us. Um, do you fly with the reserve, or do you have reserve and just use it as a weight, or are you still flying without a reserve? Let us know in the chat because that's some that's pretty interesting. We got eighteen likes, twenty one viewers. Um, we appreciate any thumbs up or if you don't like it, yeah. thumbs down. It's all good metrics. I don't really care. So there you go. I was mad reserve yet. At, at Aviator, they didn't let us have reserves during training, but yeah. we were students. They explained it to us and it makes sense. But when I left training with 26 flights in my own gear, uh -huh. I had a reserve on from that flight on. Yeah. But, yeah. I need to get a reserve, but I've, uh, but I, I'm thinking that I need to get a new harness to go with the reserve because I've got this Kangook reserve and it's, I'm going to have to string it all through and it's huh. not the most comfortable uh, harness. So uh -huh. I was thinking of getting one from Scout and get the, and then they'll install the reserve right there at the factory and do all that. So, but it still takes time to get it all. I should probably just do it and get it and do it myself. Well, the question is, do you want a side mount reserve or a lap reserve? You I know? was just thinking that it's like, um, there's, there's the lap reserve, you know, that you can just put on, you can put on any harness that you fly. Yeah. Any it's motor that you fly. Four clips and you're done. It's so my, quick. My thought is if, if you're going to be doing barrel rolls and stuff, you probably need both. Oh, uh, you know, I, I was talking to, Kyle Mooney, and I think he flew with three reserves when I met him. Yeah, but he's up there doing an infinite tumble. Yeah, um, acro yeah. pilots always. I think good acro pilots who are serious are always carrying at least two. You know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I would definitely fly with reserve every time. But the the thing is, most of them are rated to not 
you know, really open and deploy properly unless you're like 500 feet or above. Right. Uh, most of my flying is rarely above 500 feet. I mean, I'm yeah. all about profile flying, but having it there gives me a, some peace of mind. So, you yeah, know, for there's sure. something for that. Well, if, you, if you're going to do big wing overs or barrel rolls, I, I personally would recommend you get up, you know, over a thousand feet. Um, that's because general, like you said, if you're going to do a maneuver where you're going to drop that quickly, you know, and it needs 600 feet to open safely, then you want to be able to have that thing opening at 600 or around there, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, it, to me, it makes sense. Honestly, when, when I was training as well, I didn't use a reserve either because it's kind of bulky. It's in the way. And a lot of times, you know, from my perception, with the exception of just getting up, holding a throttle, you know, most of the students, once you're off the ground, you're not going to do anything crazy. Um, so you're, if anything, you're just going to float down or accidentally kill the motor or, you know, something like that. It's not going to be like you're going to need a reserve deployed. Um, so. Uh, yeah. And, and as an instructor, you're going to keep them in that safety bubble as well. You're not going to send them up in turbulent conditions and whatnot. Right. Right. Yeah. A lot of times when I was uh, training the instructor, if the air was even the slightest bit questionable, he'd go up for like five minutes and just test the air for us. You know, that's, that's me now. I'm the wind dummy. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's yeah. a good yeah. job to have. <laughs> yeah. Bill H says when he flies with one, Deweese Mill said, said, I don't have a reserve yet. Um, the, uh, the van lander said ordered one think will be here in 2023. Mark H that's the PPG trike jockey says you got a reserve. PPG Lear says fly with the reserve every flight. Gary Collins fly with the reserve and, uh, Bill H said lap reserve. Yeah. Um, and also too, you know, you have the round reserve and you got steerable. So who has round and who has steerable? I think mine's a, a round reserve. Um, it's not a steerable reserve. Um, I've heard different things about the steerable reserves, um, you know, that they're effective or not that effective or, you know, thinking about how much time you're going to have to get down or um, that, you know, some people think it's not that uh, important. You know, all it's really about is getting down uh, comfortably, you know, so you don't hit the ground too hard. Um, I don't know, though. I mean, the idea of having a steerable, steerable reserve in my mind, theoretically, is definitely better. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's better or not, but I did get a steerable only because there's power lines, there's trees. And if I can steer myself away from trees, away from power lines and land where I can also flare... Right. That sounds a lot better than, you know, tuck and roll on the uh, on the round ones. But that's just right. me. And can you do the steerable ones on your lap? That's what I got. Yeah, the lap one. That way I can have it on anything I fly. Cool. Yeah, I like the with mine. I like that it has uh, the flight deck right on top, like this big sheet of Velcro. So yes. I, I Velcro my phone and my stylus and my uh, altimeter right to that. It just makes it easy. Oh, that sounds like an awesome idea. I've been yeah. trying to figure out what to do with that thing or to get a flight deck. I might as well just get a reserve and use it as that. Yeah, you could use it as a flight deck, you know. That's and that's I the got. thing. If you have everything right there, you're you're not having to worry at times like, you know, about reaching around in your non-throttle hand and grabbing it from the side and pulling it. It's like right there in front of you. You're always looking at the handle, you know. <laughs> er Eric, that is, is, that is true. Eric in the chest says, I don't know if my round is reserved or square yet. I haven't opened it yet. Yeah. But um, hopefully, my, hopefully never have to. <laughs> yeah. my, mine is exactly two years old as a new reserve is due for his first check. So I have been talking with people for a while now about us trying to do some sort of reserve simulator off of a zip line or something. Uh -huh. um, I mean, we, we got to get something like that going, man. I mean, I hate to just hang myself in a harness and throw it see, with a fan going to see if it opens, but yeah. I, I really don't know what else to do. I mean, I got to do, I got to set it off to be checked and I want to, you know, do a simulated toss before I set it off to be repacked. So, I mean, what can we do? You know, I yeah. mean, you can, you can do a SIV and pull it on the SIV. Yeah. I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother show. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. When I did SIV, it was over salt water, and that was the only thing we didn't do because, you know, uh, Fabul's attitude was he thought it was a very benign maneuver and that, you know, opening it in salt water, then we have to wash it out, you know, so he that was the only thing we didn't do. I incidentally did wind up going into the water, but it wasn't because of my own uh, mistake or anything. I, there was a tow line failure. So I wound up drifting down and landing in the ocean all the same. So inevitably my wing and the reserve and my harness and everything else had to get washed out in the river. And that, oh, was, a whole, that was a whole fiasco, man. I guess I'm glad I landed in fresh water with gators then. It sounds yeah. a lot better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. I'm glad I used uh, somebody else's reserve also and uh, a different wing. I didn't uh -huh. use my own, so that was really nice. Yep, I went in with my brand new Luna at the time. I was so oh, pissed. I was no. so pissed. Yep. Dude, I had four flights on my spider when I, set, I put it to sink. Uh -huh. but, uh, oh, well. Yeah. Did Still you catch a fish with it? Did you catch a fish no. with it? No. Uh, my, my name's not David Ruff. I can't catch fish with my wing, so... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or David Wolf, I think. Yeah, was. David Wolf. Yeah, that'd be so funny. You fell so gracefully, though, Brian. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was graceful. Loved it. It's. Uh, I mean, you you got a couple of things in 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 your um, uh, in your backpack that are making you famous. I mean, you just do some amazing things that keep you famous. I mean, every year, I, I'm 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 scared. What's going to happen next oh. year? <laughs> no, no, there's, there's no, nothing else going to happen. I'm not talking on wood. Um, no, nah, man, I, I'm going to put out a video soon. I got a couple of videos I'm going to put out. One of them's about my experience getting into training with people to fly. And another one's about, uh, you know, uh, being an expert at the hay bale slalom and how to do it properly and how not to do it. Because after I broke my leg on the hay bale, uh, that was actually the first time I did the hay bale slalom ever when I broke mm -hmm. my leg. And, uh, man, I've done it like 30 times since. I've got some good video of me getting down there low. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's there's a video coming soon where I can find some time to process. You know, that's always an issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got lots of good video to put together. I just got to put it together. Yep, I say that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, time, man. although I, I have to say it's like if i didn't if i didn't travel in the winter to a tropical place that's all i'd have to do because in eugene it's like it's constantly raining in oregon so i'm not flying i sometimes wonder honestly on the note of like all the controversy that we see in the paramotor groups and all the drama i always kind of joke it's like man you guys got to put the freaking computer away and just get on a plane and go somewhere where it's flyable because people have way too much time on their hands, <laughs> you know, arguing about menial crap, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I don't even look at that stuff. I, I don't even have time for that. And yeah, I, I go out and fly. I'm doing something. I'm designing. I'm talking with paramotor buddies or flying with paramotor buddies. And yeah. I, I don't care about paramotor drama. I, I, yeah, I don't want to deal with that. That's, yeah, that's same, ridiculous. Same. I don't understand it. You know? I don't either. It's like, go out and fly. What do you, what's going on yeah. here? Just go fly. Yeah. yeah. Or make videos. Like I was saying, like, geez. I know, right. <laughs> <laughs> jump on, jump on here and do a podcast or just jump on and, and get together and, and talk with friends and sure. have a good time, man. That's what this stuff is all about is to go yeah. out and have fun, meet all new right. friends yeah. and, and, uh, you know, just love the sport and, you know, talk to uh, with you, others, man. Yeah. You know? Share with others. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I helped some people kite some wings that had never kited a wing before, and two of them That's already cool. signed up for a class. I mean, nice. you know, there, there's, uh, I mean, going to fly-ins, you know, making videos is kind of secondary to me. To, to me, is, is hanging out with the people and flying. Like today, you know, I went flying with Dad, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so, right. you know, if I'm not putting out videos, it's because I'm out living life. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and that, that's where it's at. I try to make time on Mondays and you know whatnot to, to be on this show. But when I'm not here, it's because, uh, well, I'm out flying and, and living right. my dream. Yep. So, yeah, live it up, man. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Forget about the haters and, you know, do what you can and be a good steward of the sport. And, yep. And, and man, it, 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 the sport's really been a blessing back to me. 
um, with that attitude, you know? Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I feel the same way. It's like, this has totally changed my life, uh, the direction of my life and how I feel about life. So mm -hmm. um, paramotors is everything I, I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to do paramotors the rest of my life, you know, yeah. and love it. Yep. For me, it's one of those things There's like a handful of things that keep me in the present Yes. And especially with all the chaos in the world that we're all dealing with on multiple levels. For me, I, you know, I, I had this experience once where I was out in a field at like six o'clock in the morning, a light fog on the field, waiting for things to clear, dew on the grass, beautiful mountains. All I could hear is birds chirping. And, you know, when we first learn to start a paramotor, you're supposed to yell, clear prop, you know. And for me, there was nobody else around. I got in the habit of saying that anyway. And for me, it was like started up the paramotor and it should have been clear mind because the minute that prop started spinning, there was nothing else except me and the prop and the gorgeous surroundings. And then you get up in the air, right means you go right, left means you go right. The surroundings are absolutely gorgeous. And all you have is that present moment. There's nothing else to think about. You know, it's just the experience you're in right then. And that's, for me, that's where I want to live. <laughs> you know? exactly. I, I try and everything I do to try to stay present um, because it's too easy to get it trapped in your mind. You know, all the things that have happened or could potentially happen that are bad. Um, so always marking things to look forward to and flying is definitely every experience. It's what's they saying? Like we can all say that every flight we ever have is the best flight we've ever had, you yes. know? because it's you know there's always something in every flight that is just a completely magic moment you can fly the same terrain again and again and again and there's always something that you experience that is just mind-blowing you know at, at some course within that time exactly and also to anybody that's watching this or listening to this uh the next time you go and start your motor uh say clear prop tv tv yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. there you go that's all right there there's you know, my first engine out was an accident. It was like flight 170 or something. I was too scared to hit that kill switch before then. And uh, so since then, I've hit the kill switch several times from like 500,000 feet, done dead stick landings, recranks, that kind of thing. You know what I say when I recrank my engine? I'm in the air all by myself. What's that? Clear prop TV? Clear prop. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's just it's just a habit man it's like yeah. you know nobody's around but you say it because you know you're about to crank the engine that's what yeah. you're supposed yeah. to say yeah. yep yeah it was it just in that me. mental frame of mind too yeah right 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 yeah clearing clearing your mind clearing the prop making sure it's safe you know i i had always i always used to joke that you know when i first started seeing paramotors i was like man you're wearing a cuisinart on your back you know, it's, it's making contact with that prop. That's the end. You know? yeah. So it wasn't until, you know, I don't know, a couple months in that I, I really fathomed the idea that, you know, with the exception of a video I saw recently of a guy, you know, getting his hand in the prop, you know, behind him. Did you guys see that video? Um, I think I lost a finger. But I, I my, my point is that I never... Uh, I never thought that, that was the case that once you're wearing the motor on your body, you're not going to ever make contact with the prop. So I, I, it was, it just felt that much safer at that point. Yeah. I think I saw the video that you're talking about where um, he lost a, a finger. Yeah. Somehow he reached around or might've gotten a line caught in his prop yeah. or something. Um, but I never thought that that was possible that you could actually reach behind the cage in you know, in the position where you're wearing the, the motor. Um, Did you yeah, see yeah. the Van Lander's uh, question, Sean? That would be something. What, what's the What's the question? It's about it's, uh, uh, it's uh, regarding the lap uh, mount versus the side mount. Has okay, the throw angle has no benefit of either lap or side mount. Oh, in other words, is there a benefit or? not to one or the other oh um as, as far as so the way i clip okay so i have my main um, glider into one set of carabiners on my paramotor 
okay then i have my reserve here connected to my straps here that are underneath the straps to a different set of carabiners so if this thing collapses and i pull this out left or right at any angle it's yeah. going to come out this way and come up um you know where the uh, main chute would be behind so as far as i know i haven't thrown it yet yeah. as far as i know no matter where i am i can throw with my left or right because the carabiners are on my straps here mm -hmm. and not using the straps or the carabiners that my main glider is on, I think that I should be all right. Um, I don't know, we'll, we'll find out if the, whenever I have a collapse and I'm going down and I'm like, there's nothing else to do to, other than throw this, we'll find out what happens and I'll tell you if I can uh, steer the damn thing. I don't know yet, I haven't thrown it and I really don't want to, because yeah, well, yeah. that, that well, sounds scary. Thing. The one thing you mentioned was, I guess, in terms of advantage or disadvantage to one or the other, if you have it in front of you, theoretically, you could grab it with either hand. Or yep. both hands. Just, yeah, I mean, just both, both hands. hands exactly. despite, the, despite the throttle being in your hand. Whereas yeah. if, it's on one, if it's on your non-throttle side, you're going to be grabbing it with the non-throttle hand. Right. You know, you're not going to be reaching across and, you know, and throwing it that way. And, and what are all the, I mean, look at all the different things that could happen. What happens if your uh prop shreds or something right and i don't know somehow your your hand gets uh zapped or something or your your um your throttle gets sucked into the back right so you, now your throttle hand gets sucked back i mean how are you going to get to your your reserve if it's on the other side i mean i don't know like i said there's just so many different reasons that i chose to get one of the the lap ones is because what happens if you know my hand gets numb what happens if my hand gets caught up in the in a in a line i mean if i'm doing acro or something and the lines go slack what happens if they get wrapped around a hand yeah, yeah. i don't think any of this stuff is going to happen but i'm thinking to myself what's the best way to go and i thought a steerable one that's on my lap would be the safest one i do want to get one that's on the side eventually um but uh, as of right now when i the only time i ever do any maneuvers is at an siv course um i don't do maneuvers when i'm out you know flying around when i fly it's like i want to go on a cross country i want to go from here to there i want to check out this new place i want to come around and look at this you know maybe maybe some some small wing overs or something but you know after going through the siv courses and having brand new wings all right and then doing acro on them in one year i stretched out my lines so bad that i had to replace the lines yeah um and if you do heavy acro you know and you have a brand new wing and you you spit out 25 or 35 you know 100 dollars on a brand new wing and now you gotta spend another hundred dollars or seven hundred dollars to yeah, replace the lines there, every yeah. year I mean that's that gets really expensive so after my my first two wings my third my third wing it's like i'm not doing any acro on this booger i'm just gonna go up i'm gonna fly i'm gonna have a good time and that thing will last me for two years without having to worry about my lines being stretched yeah <sighs> that's all for 700 bucks oh yes yeah, sir now go, go ahead jared well i was just thinking about the the steerable reserve thing again in terms of like Theoretically, if you throw a reserve and you depower your main wing, what you're supposed to do is grab the wing and reel it in, and then you've got this giant bundle on your lap. No, so not a lap. You just, you just need a stall ball. You know, just need to pull it in and have it being a big stall ball. You don't need to pull it on your lap, as long as okay. it's not. You know, as long as it, as long as it doesn't, you know, um, inflate. So if you just pull it in and it's a big stall ball in front of you, that's really right. all you need. But I guess the question was then, if you're holding it like this, how are you going to steer your steerable? No, you just yeah. pull it all in. All of your lines can be on one hand. I see. And then so you're now, so now, you, now you're steering. All your lines are one hand. You got a big stall ball. Okay. Okay. Or you're able to pull it in, tuck it underneath, you know, um, and then go back up. Whatever it is, as long as it's not, you know, floating around and doesn't re, you know, apply, you know, yeah, yeah. deploy and and. You know, cause grab spin. you in one yeah. direction, really. Yeah, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, then, how are you going to light your cigarette? Yeah, right. <laughs> with with a zippo, with a zippo, they're the wind, they're windproof. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or more, you know, that's a zippo. 
Yeah. More importantly, he's got to take that selfie while he's uh, plummeting to the earth. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why you have that. a 360 on at all times to capture that going. Oh, oh yeah. shit! Oh yeah, and and chink, you're, you're, chink, you're chink, really chink, right there, right? It's wrapped around the selfie stick, you know. You just pull the selfie <laughs> stick in, and you got your 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 main wing on the selfie stick. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm telling you, the things that I don't want to happen. Yeah, hey. serious. So, the, oh. one thing I would add to the advantage of having the reserve on the side versus the the front. Um, in training, I was taught that you always want your throttle in your dominant hand if you're flying with a side reserve. So if you're right-handed, you want a right-handed throttle. I'm sorry, if you're if you're right-handed, you want a left-handed throttle. Yeah. So your right hand is open. Right. Um, throw your reserve. Right. Of course, I am totally backwards with that. I'm left-handed, and I fly with a left-handed throttle because that's what they all came as, and that's why I huh. used to. Um, but the idea is that if you get stuck down you know, on a spiral or something like that, and you have a hard time reaching across to one side, you know, the, the chest center mount is always the way to go. Yeah. Because no matter where your throttle hand is, um, you can always get to it. So, yeah. So I think Sean's probably got the, the, the best bet. I mean, if you're going to be flying an acro, doing these big things, you, you need two reserves, and one yeah. of them needs to be a chest mount. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, and, and also like uh, somebody was telling me two reserves, generally you ha- you might have a full size, full weight reserve, like a heavy duty reserve. And then you could get other reserves that pack a lot smaller and lighter for a second reserve. Yeah, I mean, remember Woody uh, Gamertag, he went down, his first reserve didn't go and he had to yeah. pull his other reserve. Yep. You know, um, I remember so seeing I- that. I would not want to be in that where you see that your canopy is just, you know, in rags, you throw it and it goes into it. And you're like, oh, crap. Now I'm just going yeah. down. I wish I had another one. Yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah, I mean, that's he's a dedicated <laughs> acro pilot, though. You know? But yeah. but that's but that's the reason why, you know, I, I have I mean, you can go up on a tow machine and and do acro. I mean, you can go to SIV course. They're not that expensive, it's like 400 bucks a day and all the toes that you usually can uh, can do in a day. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not that expensive and to be able to go up and practice these, you know, these maneuvers and know that, you know, if something goes wrong, you throw a reserve and you're going to go into some nice water and get picked up. That's, that's a good thing. Oh yeah. You know, sure. um, so uh, I, I know that we talked a lot about how to do things on this podcast, but um uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we don't, we're not teaching you how to do this or telling you to go do this. And this is how to do it. Uh, we're telling you what we've done, but we recommend you going to see a professional and preferably an SIV course where you can do all these things and do them safely with a qualified instructor. 100%. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not encouraging people to self-train off YouTube. Uh, we're, we're trying to help people all of us have made mistakes, no matter how good our training was. Um, and I think most of us on this panel are the type of people that put those mistakes out there so we can all learn from it. Uh, I, I know for sure that most of us are. And, uh, you know, that, that's where it's at. I mean, you know, you, I was talking about, you know, doing wing overs versus going in and doing that full barrel roll. And I think the most important thing you said there was baby steps. Yeah. Um, just slow baby steps, progression, feeling yourself. You know, you're going to make those slow progressions, and then sometimes you're going to get a little light in that wing. You're going to back off, like, oh, I need to approach that a little differently. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's that's that inner conscience of yours telling you to back off, and uh, you, you better listen to that. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Yeah, totally. Anyway, that's, that's the end of my rant. Um, yeah, but no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now no, fly with reserve, get proper training. <laughs> yep, exactly. And and you know, in terms of do things when you're ready to do them, and make sure that you're completely committed and being present when you're doing them. You know, um, nothing reckless. Like if you're not ready, if you don't feel it, don't do it. You know, exactly. But so just check in with yourself. You know, that's one of the, one of the other things that we learn when we first start to, you know, fly. One of the number one rules is, or one number one lessons is learn when not to fly. And an, intuit, an intuitive sense is part of that. It's not just the weather. It's like, ah, something's off today. I didn't sleep well enough. I'm then not in a great mood. My head's not in it. Even though the weather's great, maybe it's not the best thing for me to do today. 
you know. There's been many times I've gone out to the airport, unpacked everything, and I'm like, I don't know. Um, I don't feel it. Or yeah. I, I, yeah. Blow, uh, I blow a couple launches and I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. okay. I'm going to go home and watch YouTube videos on flying a paramotor. I don't need to go out and fly right now. Something's wrong. Yeah. And, I, and I, I still don't know what. You know, I still don't know what. There's been times that I've gone out there and I've blown three launches in a row and I'm like, what is going on? I know everything's right. I kited this wing. I prepped everything. Why is not, I don't know, maybe it's this. Pack yeah. up. It doesn't bother me a bit. Go home. Yep. Anybody else do that? Oh, yeah. Many times. Yeah. You know, what, what, what Joe used to teach us was if you blow three in a row, stop. Take a break. Take off a layer, go get a drink of water, relax, catch your breath. There's no rush, you know. Mm -hmm. You should, you know, the, the the when accidents happen, it's usually because for some reason you're super anxious, you're supercharged, you don't do a free foot free flight check, um, you you exhaust yourself, you're not thinking straight, you know. It's it's just uh it's so much more important to be completely present and ready to do what you are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100% agree, man. I mean, I think most of us, if we were to go out to the field by ourselves, there's nobody else around, and we get that feeling, we'll probably cancel that flight. You yeah. know, we probably won't go. Where it gets you in trouble is where you're with all your buddies, and they're getting up in the air. They've got more experience than you do. Their bump tolerance is way higher than yours is, and uh, you're you're not quite feeling it. And they go flying, and you push yourself to get up there anyway. And uh, I think that's where you can get in trouble. Yeah. Um, you can have flights you're not happy with. Um, definitely be too bumpy for you. Um, I've been in that situation a couple times, and I'm pretty good at not, you know, I guess they call it peer pressure, or you want to call it, you know, whether you put it on yourself or somebody else puts it on you, that's what it is. And uh, I think they call it para pressure. Para <laughs> pressure. <laughs> that's the opposite of para waiting. It's para going, and it can get you in yeah. trouble, right? Yeah, for sure. No, uh, yeah, that, and I've said those very words too. I'm just not Brian. When when, when we were flying uh, at the nice grass strip um, in Central North Carolina, I just wasn't feeling it that day, and I I decided not to fly. I had a yeah. good time watching everyone else fly, but I wasn't feeling it, so I didn't do it. But um, I was gonna, I was going somewhere with that, and I lost my train of thought. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what was that <laughs> oh oh that's what it was i was talking this is probably a, a, a couple of months ago there was a newer pilot uh and we were flying as a group not going anywhere it's just a group of us tooling around and less the conditions were, were less than perfect i mean perfectly comfortable for me I, I was i was okay flying in those conditions but um the pilot said well i gotta i gotta learn how to do it sometime and I was thinking about that on the way home. And the fact of the matter is, no, you don't. You don't have to do anything. I mean, this is a yeah. sport. I got into the sport to enjoy it. And if you're the kind of person that just likes smooth butter air, cool. I mean, there's no problem with it. So there's no reason to push it, you know, unless you want to fly in those kind of conditions. And then, right. you know, so um, the feeling of, I, I can't remember, peer pressure or, that peer pressure can also be pressure from yourself thinking Absolutely. that you have to do it. Right. Um, anyways, that's the end of my rant, Brian. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and when, when I was talking to one of my first students up, you know, uh, earlier this week, somebody else was up flying and, you know, I could tell he was trying to, you know, uh, get up there and be with him to get his first flight with one of his instructors. And I said, just, you know, slow down take your time, go through all the steps and uh, forget about everybody else and, and uh, just be you and your equipment and, you know, be safe. And, and he did, he slowed down and he got up in the air, no problem and everything. But yeah, I mean, I think we are, we are all can be our worst critics and uh, we can pressure ourselves probably as bad or worse as, as, as other people pressure us to go flying because we've all had those friends, you know, say, Hey man, if it's not for you today, don't worry about it. You know, and, and they're sincere and they mean it, but we push ourselves to go anyway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can say I can say all the lines I've ever sliced, 
have likely or mostly been for times when I've been rushing to get up in the air, the wind switches and I'm too lazy to unclip or to readjust my wing to take off into the wind. And next thing I know, the wing goes sideways and I make a line and it's like, oh, well, there goes the sunset. It would have taken me literally two minutes to reset and I would have been able to go, but I was too anxious, you know, and too much of in a rush to, to, to do it. So. And luckily that just became a valuable lesson that you learned, you know, from. Yep. instead of you know an accident so yeah that's good stuff but guys i'm gonna have to run hey i got a bell <laughs> <laughs> good man well it is after nine o'clock um this is a lot longer than uh, i was expecting so let's go ahead and uh, say goodbye um uh brian go ahead and say your goodbyes first and how do we get up with you buddy well well first off i was just gonna say jared you're an incredible guest man um you have this huge wealth of knowledge i wish we could just do multiple shows and carry on because i feel like we can learn a lot more from you um you you got you got a cool location you fly i've been over there and uh it sounds like you get to do some really cool adventure trips you should definitely look up one up adventures i will for sure check them out man they can help you do what you're trying to do um but you know if you if you want to check out my youtube videos you can uh, look at ppgbrian.com Okay, Thanks to Fearless Leader, Sean Simons, PPG Grandpa, gave us all our own PPG websites, and uh, it makes it easy. But, uh, no, I, this, this is a great sport. Um, I've got a lot of great friends in this sport um, because of Sean and his show and, and, and whatnot. Uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than going to fly-ins and meeting these people and uh, working with new students and seeing the – the reaction on a student's face when they they get that first landing and that first flight under their belt that's that's uh something i think i'm gonna enjoy for a long time man oh yeah but, that's uh, the best man yeah yeah it, it is that's that's kind of where it's at for me now but uh yeah it's the best way to get high man y'all need to get paramotors you know uh they will change your life yep all right buddy well cool. thank you so much for for um hanging with us brian um um hopefully we'll catch you again soon all right man cool peace take care man stay in touch peace out buddy so jared uh any other words of wisdom or anything else like that before we head on out any other thing that you'd like to say that maybe you haven't said well um i am first of all very grateful for the opportunity to join you guys and and have this conversation it was great i honestly didn't expect it to go that long either but i really enjoyed (laughs) everybody and you know the feedback's been terrific um so yeah maybe do it again um and for sure i hope to catch you guys at a fly-in are is anybody planning or thinking about going to salton sea in february from where you guys are I don't think so. I think I'm going to do maybe bad, bad apples again and uh, something else probably, but I don't know. Okay. Well, at some point, I hope we get a chance to cross paths and fly together, you know? Um, Absolutely, bud. But yeah, as far as uh, words of wisdom or, or, um, you know, futuresque things, you know, I'm, I'm in the point where I'm at the point where I'm, like I said, I'm about to invest in this trike. I want to do tandems. Um, I'm playing around with doing a more official school, you know, so I'll keep you posted on that when I get that all together and, um, you know, try to rally some people uh, here in the Northwest. I have, um, I'm not sure if you know, uh, Morgan Yobert, he'd probably be a really good guy to get on the show as well. Um, He just started Rise Paramotor in um, Bend, Oregon, and he's a terrific pilot. He's also training acro. Uh, He's, he's totally got his stuff together. Cool. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely uh, keep you posted. And uh, as things come together for me and I and I dive deeper into the sport, I will be uh, very psyched to talk to you guys about what my experiences are and learn from everybody. Well, awesome. Now, you are on our guest chat. So any Monday that we jump on, you can jump on anytime with us and yeah. just be on and be on the panel. Absolutely. Cool. Right, and uh, yeah, you can ask, you can ask the, get the next guest questions yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, that's that's how we yeah. get our panel is just from past guests. Cool. So we do. We just hang out and share stories. And I don't fly, but I, I'm i telling you, um, every, every time I go, like I found you, Jared, you know, uh-huh. I watch videos and everything. And I, I was very impressed with, you know, the videos and everything that you do and your energy and all that. And that's why I just, 
That's why it's like, come on, our show. Come on. Yeah, we need, no, that you was know. awesome. Come I on. really appreciate Join you us releasing and, that. Yeah, cool. and thank you so much. I Absolutely. Really, yeah, really appreciate it. But um, real quick, see my son, Robert Michaels, he has a show on Thursday night. I don't know if you've seen it yet. ParagridingTalk.com. Uh -huh. So on Thursdays, I'll send you the link. Okay. And uh, he flies at Torrey Pines a lot. Okay. In San Diego. So you you said you were talking about flying like beach flying and off the coast uh -huh. and everything. Yep. It's it's a very popular, uh, really cool place to fly. Oh yeah, Torrey Pines. I've I've had a couple friends who've gone down there, and uh, I guess they yeah. were telling me about how you have to get a site briefing. Um, and you have to have your rating and you could do, you know, ratings to like a crash course for ratings, but you have to understand because it's a pretty active uh, USPA, uh, HPA site that um, you have see. to know the rules to fly there um, okay. and join the I'll, club kind of thing. I'll have to hook you up with Robert and he can give you all the details on that, you know, cool. as far as ratings and all that. Cause I, I know nothing about that. I just, you know, I just hang out with you guys and hang out with Robert's <laughs> show and follow all the shows and. That's what I call cool. Caramon, you know. Awesome. But, um, yeah, it's a pretty cool place. And then he flies at Blossom too. Uh huh. And now uh, in San Diego, and that's a beautiful place, Blossom uh -huh. Valley. Like, cool. You know. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm hoping to head down to Salton Sea in February. Um, that was okay. the break I was going to take. So if I'm in that area, you know, by San Diego, you know, maybe I'll connect. Yeah, Robert was thinking of, he was talking about flying there. So yeah, but I'll definitely, I'll send you the link um of a show on Thursday uh on Thursday okay check it out cool. so. That's thank awesome. you Jared like I yeah, said thank, thank you so much for joining us yeah, Absolutely. and and in case Jared doesn't know, and and just in case you're new out there listening to us or watching us here, uh, every Monday night on ClearPropTV.com we have this also called PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast on any of your favorite audio podcasting apps, including um, Audible. Uh, Amazon Music and Amazon. If you search for PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast, we come up the audio. It's awesome. Cool. If you uh, uh, if you want to listen to another podcast on Tuesday, on the first of every or the first Tuesday of every month, you go to ppgshane.com and Shane does a paramotor hangout. Uh, the rest of the month, you can go to ppglear.com on Tuesdays and listen to the paramotor hangout. We also on Wednesday have an all female podcast from Flying Flamingo Jade. And you can find her at paramotorgirl.com on Wednesdays. And of course, on Thursdays, we got paraglidingtalk.com. Right. That's right. That's right. So that's all the podcasts that are out there, except there's one across the pond, the Fat Paramotor Podcast, which you can find if you search for the Fat Paramotor Podcast on Google. You can also find right. them on Amazon and Audible also, just like us, which is really cool. All right. We also got Jim up in Canada, A, that does all of our printing for us and hooks us up, that helped us make all those paramotor calendars. You can find us over at the paramotorcalendar.com. Order yours now. Thank you, Jim, for hooking us up and helping us print those. How do we get up with your printing shop, sir? You can check me out at uh, carepp.com and uh, through email or give me a call. All my contact information is there. And I've got a, a YouTube channel as well, courtesy of PPG Grandpa, oh. the careppg.com. That's awesome. All your crazy shenanigans. What, what flight are you up to? I know that you're almost at 100 the last time we talked. I think 93 or 94 now. All right. Woo. Let us know when you cross that 100 mark. That's that's pretty awesome. That's a, that's a heck of a... A landmark or a air air mark? I don't know. Whatever. It's <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Well, thank you, Jim, for helping us out with all that. Um, carepp.com and carepg.com. We also got Will Fly at willflyppg.com. Tell us about all your shenanigans and what you do, brother man. All right. Hey, well, I have, first of all, I wanted to say uh, thank you very much, Jared. I thoroughly enjoyed the show, so I appreciate you coming on, man. And like Ryan was saying early earlier uh, flying 
has become secondary really to all the great people I've met in this sport. So uh, it's just been awesome. Awesome. You can, find me, you can find me on YouTube. I'm Will Fly or uh, WillFlyPPG.com. That'll take you to that'll take you to uh, YouTube also. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, if you want to get up with us and want to be on the show, make sure you hit up ParamomUSA.com, which brings you over to Linda Anderson's Facebook page. And she's also our cheerleader, our PR chick. I mean, she's just everything. So we definitely appreciate her. <laughs> If you want to get up yeah. with me, you can always find me at iFlyParamotors.com. Wow, that is like the coolest. Hey, iFlyParamotors.com. I need to make a bumper sticker or something. That's so cool, right? iFlyParamotors. Yeah. And of course, go. I'm PPG Grandpa, and you can find me at PPGGrandpa.com. Anyways, thank you very much for watching us. Jared, thank you, dude. Hang, thank you bro. for hanging out with us for two, almost two and a half hours on the podcast. Great. This is one of our longest podcasts we've had in a very long time. So, yeah. I mean, you just made it flow. Normally it's like, all right, try to do about an hour. And, you know, another yeah. hour went by and an hour and a half, dude, you, just a wealth of knowledge, so much okay. information. Um, definitely want you to come back anytime that you want to and hang with us on the yeah. on the show here. I mean, just, I mean, if, if you just want to be on the panel and not say anything, just be on the show. That's fine. I don't care. Yeah, I appreciate that, bro. You, I will definitely check in for sure. Cool. Awesome. And like I said, as as things progress for me, I have uh, I'm playing around with Sky Monkey PPG. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine said they like watching me fly. I'm like a little monkey in the sky, so I, I think I might go with that. Um, oh, that's cool. That's but yeah, cool. As, it, as it as it progresses, you know, that'll be uh, more of a thing. And then for the meantime, if anybody wants to reach me, just Jared Kaplan PPG um, works. Um, as I, I told you guys before we started recording. Um, you know, my my YouTube is kind of all over the place. I think I've got probably 50 videos out, but they're splayed between Jared Kaplan, PPG, Jared Kaplan, spelled different ways. Um, but you can find me on YouTube. My thing has been making videos more like music videos as opposed to, you know, monetizing videos using generic music because I generally like to edit to the music that I apply to or, you know, music that suits the mood of the of the flight. So um they're all over the place, but they'll as they come together, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you guys know how to reach me in a way that's uh, more consolidated. Absolutely, and I also got your YouTube link in the show notes down below, so anybody should be able to just click that and make sure you go there, subscribe. I mean, at the very beginning of this uh, show, you had sixty six subscribers, so make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit that bell notification. So when he starts putting up these videos, you're like, oh, I'm there, I'm there, dude, I got gotcha. you. All right. Anything else before we head on out and about? Good. All right. So we're going to end this real quick, but you guys don't go anywhere. After we um, kill oh, the live okay. feed, we're going to talk for a couple of minutes and hang out. Uh, so, so anyways, uh, thank you very much for joining us here on PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast. If you're searching for us on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app, of course, every Monday night, find us at clearproptv.com or listen to us at paratalk.org. Jared, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Thank we you, appreciate you very, very much. And we will see you tomorrow. Will, are we? where are we going to meet this? I just saw on on, on the uh, chat that it's, uh, is it going to be Will Fly PPG? Is that where the chat's going to be? Oh, it's going to be, you, you said it right the first time. It's at yeah. uh, PPG Lear, L E A R.com tomorrow. Yes, it is. All right. And then uh, Wednesday, we're going to go to paramotorgirl.com. And then Thursday, paraglidingtalk.com. Yeah. Well, have a great oh. evening. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. And we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, right. Peace out. Don't go nowhere, guys. <laughs>